Chapter One of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter One, Discovery of the Mine. Ben Ralston and his cousin Beth were sitting on the northern slope of Russian Hill, one of the many hills of San Francisco. At the foot of the elevation, the black buildings and smokeless chimney of an abandoned smelting works rose from the beach which skirted the hill. Beyond, the blue base sparkled in the sunlight, except where fleeting cloud shadows raced across its surface. I was born just about forty years too late, the boy remarked with emphasis. But the city's a big place, and it's getting bigger and bigger. I heard a man say so today. I know all that, Beth, and the reason is there are more people coming all the time. Everyone who comes lessens my chances to get on. Forty years ago, there weren't many folks here, but there were a heap of chances. I had a feeling when I came up here today you weren't going to take that place in Stratton's store. What made you think so? Oh, I just guess so from the way you talked. You always talk that way when you're blue. She buried one of her hands in the shining sand on which it rested. Think. He pointed to the huge chimney at the foot of the hill. Think of the gold the fire of that chimney has melted. And then expect me to be an errand boy at three dollars a week with a chance of a raise to four and six months? I tell you, Beth, I can't do it. I'm not that kind. I get so wild thinking of it all. If it were something more to do, or something where I could get ahead quicker, I wouldn't be so dead set against it. Sid would like the place, I think, if you're positive you'll not take it. Well, he's welcome to it. Perhaps he's the plotting kind, though I never thought he was. But I've got two hundred dollars, and it's got to help me to something better. I thought you said it was three hundred. So it was, but some more bills turned up and had to be paid, so it's dwindled. I've got it in the savings bank. The girl looked at the massive pillar which reared itself before them. I should think some of the gold would have stuck to the chimney, she remarked. Her companion suddenly grasped her wrist. Beth, he exclaimed. His eyes glowed with excitement, and he sprang to his feet and whirled his hat around his head as he gave a cheer. Then he stood quite still and gazed at the chimney. The girl looked at him in wonder. What is it? she asked. I don't know myself, exactly. Maybe it's nothing, and maybe you found my fortune. I? Yes, you. What do you mean? Why, Goosey, don't you see it yet? to buy the right to mine the soot for gold, the gold of the early days. Somehow I have always felt that that would be the stuff to put me on my feet, and here it is. Maybe I've been mistaken. Maybe I wasn't born too late after all. Mine the soot? How can you? Why not? I've heard of its having been done. His face shone with hope. No one's ever thought of this, he exclaimed. Don't you see it's a big thing, he questioned as she did not speak. If you can only do it, will old Madge give you leave? He will if I pay him for it. He'd give me the right, too, to tear down the old sheds, and of course there's gold under the crazy ramshackle things. They had so much of it in the early days that they weren't any too careful. Mr. Madge would be foolish to give you the right if the gold is there. He is sort of fool crazy over his mines. He's always telling everyone all about them, how rich they are and all that. The biggest vein ever seen is always just ahead. He wouldn't come down to mining soot. But wouldn't it be his gold if you found it on his land? No, it wouldn't. Not any more his than mine. The works were just a mill to crush everybody's ore, and what's left is for the sweeper. Besides, the land is only leased anyway, and if I can go open-handed and buy the right to sweep, what I find's mine. I should think that some of it would be his too, I don't see it that way. A girl's always got such cranky ideas of business. Well, we won't quarrel about it until you get it. Shall you put in all your money? Every cent, if I have to. I'd like mighty well to have some left, though, for the expense of working the thing. Oh, Ben, suppose you shouldn't find any gold. That's the chance I've got to take. But you shall have anything you want, Beth. Her face flushed as she saw him glance at her shabby shoes and frock 
and she tried to cover her feet with the hem of her dress. These are trifles, she bravely said, pointing to them. But what I should like would be more schooling. You shall go to school, and before I get any gold either, I know a way to fix it. Don't anger Mr. Hodges, will you, Ben? She turned an anxious face toward him. I won't. I didn't tell you that I found the note of his for ninety dollars among father's papers. No, you don't expect to get it. Of course not. But I can hold it over his head for nearly two years yet. Her face brightened. And make him let me go to school. That isn't a bad scheme. We're doing great things in schemes today. Let's go through the old works. He seized her hand and they tore down the hillside until they stood out of breath before the nailed gates. Grim and gaunt, the building faced them. Boards were nailed over the broken windows and there were gaping sags in the roof. Ben found an aperture in the fence and they squeezed themselves through it into the yard. Here, he cried, is where they dumped the ore. Beth, millions of lane where we are standing. She did not appear to be greatly impressed by this dramatic statement and nervously glanced about. I should think tramps would sleep here. No fear of that, he replied. It's too cold. Come inside. She followed him timorously, feeling the mystery of a vacant house, the unseen presence of former occupants. See, Ben eagerly exclaimed, there is where the boiler stood. And there, he pointed to where some twisted and rusty pipes loosely hung against the wall like petrified serpents, is where the tank stood in which they washed the gold. They washed it before melting it into bricks. Father has told me how the men used to stand knee-deep in it in the tanks and shovel it out, just as if they were shoveling coal. They must have lost a lot. It couldn't be helped, and no one's ever worked it over. What was that? Nothing but a loose shingle in the roof. My Beth, I didn't know you were such a coward. I'm not a coward, but I don't like spooky places. She looked apprehensively toward a dark corner. Spooky. Well, I hope some old miner's ghost will kindly show me where to dig, that's all. See how wide the cracks are in the floor of this shed, he said, as he looked through an opening which led to an adjoining building. There are thousands of dollars in the dirt under it, probably. They peered into the black cracks and could almost fancy they saw the glitter of the precious metal. The boy threw back his head and gazed at the massive brickwork of the chimney. It's a chance, of course, but I'm going to take it. It's funny to think of mining for gold in the heart of San Francisco in 1901. He laughed and gave a low whistle. I'm so afraid to lose all you've got, she said. Then she suddenly made up her mind to side with him. But after all, there's a risk in everything. I'd do it if I were you, Ben, she stoutly affirmed. There's lots of risks I'd take if I were a man. That's got some grit to it, Ben approvingly replied. His seventeen-year-old vanity was flattered by being called a man. You see, he continued, if I'd been taught a trade, it would be different, or if father had had any business to leave me. But he was just like old Madge, wouldn't do anything but trade in mines. He always had a big fortune just in sight but it never came near enough to catch. That's a hard way to live. Yes, it wore Mother out never to know from month to month whether we were going to stay or move on or what our income would be. I believe all old miners are alike. Once a miner, always a miner. The gold fever of early times bewitched them for all the rest of their lives. Take care you're not bewitched too. It's entirely different with me, he began. No, it isn't, she interrupted. But I'm with you, Ben. Oh, what a crazy scheme it is. She laughed at his troubled face. What was that? It is something in the house. It's someone in the yard, Ben replied, looking out. A man's figure appeared in the doorway. Good afternoon, Mr. Madge, Ben said. We are viewing your property. With a floor, this would make a first-rate skating rink. The man came toward them. Of medium stature, with a halting gait, as though his joints were rusty, he helped himself along by the aid of a stout hooked cane. A sparse gray beard covered the lower part of his face, which was flush from liquor. He looked uncomfortably warm, and he took off his shabby, broad-brimmed hat and ran his fingers through his hair until it stood erect in tufts. A skating rink! Like as not would come down about your heads. Run home, girl, he said to Beth. This is no place for you. We were just going when you came in, Ben replied before she could answer. 
Good night. Didn't you want to talk to him about the scheme, she asked, when they were out of hearing. Not when he's in that condition. I wouldn't take advantage of him. Run home now before Mrs. Hodges has a chance to scold. She'll scold anyway, the girl replied. Then she shrugged her shoulders as if to dismiss an unpleasant subject, and her face brightened. Race you to the point, Ben, she cried, placing one foot forward for the start. He did not respond, but gazed at her with a preoccupied air. One, two. Still he made no answer. Her expectant attitude changed and her arms fell to her sides, while a look of disappointment spread over her face. I think it's just horrid if you're going to be pokey and grown up. I don't see why people can't work and play too, but it seems they never do. Just because you're three years older than me, you think you're grown up. Why, Beth, what's come over you? You're a man all at once, that's all. I suppose now we can't have any more fun with stilts and tar barrels, nor fly kites, nor run races, nor, nor do anything we used to do. I hate the scheme. I do. Ben laughed. Come on, he said. I'll race you. Off they went, flying along the beach until they came up breathless against the wooded slopes of Black Point. They climbed up the bank until they reached the ramparts. That was fine, Beth said, seating herself on the grassy slope. Now you can tell me more about your plan. I don't hate it any more. Spread before them was the bay, dotted with craft. Across the channel, the Marin County hills rose abruptly from the water's edge. At Fort Point, which jutted out beyond the promontory in which they were sitting, some experiments and a new explosive were being made. They watched the flash and report in the little cloud of dust the charge made when it struck the opposite shore. Above them, on a higher embankment, a sentry paced to and fro, his bayonet glistening in the sunlight. So, Dame Trot scolds a good deal, does she? Ben remarked, ignoring the invitation to expatiate on the scheme. I must stop calling her that. Her name's Mrs. Hodges. Yes, she does. I don't think she means to, though, she added. I think she's been disappointed in so many things that it's made her cross with everything. If it wasn't for poor little Sue, I couldn't stand it. Sue would miss you if you should go away. I know she would, terribly. You've thought of going, then? Oh, sometimes I think of it, but when Sue turns her poor little face and looks at me, I can't bear to think any more about it. Doesn't she look so at her mother, too? Yes, but her mother always seems to want to get her out of her sight. She wouldn't hurt her, of course, but it seems as if she held a grudge against God and Sue for her being so deformed. Somehow she acts as if she held both of them responsible for the child's misery. Most mothers would be more tender to such a child. I know it. Just cuddle it up in their arms away from all the rest of the world. But she doesn't. I guess it's because she's so selfish. She wants everything of hers to be the best. Of course it isn't, and so she's always complaining. I know. And I say, Beth, do you know that ill humor's catching? I don't like to hear you say you hate things. You know I don't mean it. Then don't say it. But how are the boys? Are they good to sue? Oh, yes. How could they help it? Even Hodges is different to her. How, Sid? Somehow I've got sort of turned against him lately. He's just the same old Sid. You say you've turned against him lately, but you know, Ben Ralston, that you never liked him. Ben laughed. I can't fool you, can I, Beth? I think I was trying to fool myself the most. Tell me about him. His mother favors him always, and that spoils him. He's envious and suspicious, always imagining that someone's going to slight him and she makes this silly feeling worse by encouraging him in it. I know he always looks sideways at me, as though he thought I meant to trip him up or eat his share of a treat or get the best of him somehow. Perhaps you'd rather I wouldn't tell him about that place. Tell him if you want to, but I don't believe you'll get any thanks for it. He'll think it's some sort of trap we set for him. How do you suppose he ever got into such a habit? Partly disposition, partly habit. It's a habit that grows, till after a while he will not trust anyone. But don't let's talk of him when we can talk about the scheme. Beth, if it pans out, I'll always think you were my fairy godmother. I? Why, I haven't done anything at all. Yes, you have. You've shown me the way, 
just like the fairy godmother who pointed out the ring in the tree trunk to Aladdin and told him to pull and a door would open that would lead down to the treasure house. That wasn't a fairy godmother. It was a magician, an old Chinaman, so I don't feel complimented. Ben did not reply. He was busily planning how to reach his treasure. I'll have to have machinery and things, and at least one man to help me, I suppose, he said. I don't know exactly what I'd better do first, but I can find out, he added with a rather blank look. A few minutes before, he had exulted in the fact that he was his own master, to negotiate the business and carry it on unaided, but already he found himself wishing for some friend of experience with whom he could consult, and a few of the difficulties to be surmounted had dawned upon him. Why not ask Hodges about it? I don't want to do that if I can help it. I know just how he'd sneer and throw cold water on it all. Couldn't you find a partner? I'm not sure that I want to. If I let others into it, I'd be afraid they'd freeze me out. Men with more money than he had did that to father lots of times. Oh, I hope you won't get cheated, Ben. She clasped her hands and looked so distressed that he laughed. I'll be too many for them. I'd better paddle my own canoe, though, and then there won't be any danger. I don't see where there need be any such thing as cheating in the world. It's a queer old world. Mother used to say that sometimes she thought it was the lunatic asylum of the universe. I should think, for instance, that in case you work over the old works and get out the gold, everybody would be glad that you'd succeeded, and would go on with their own work and earn their own money without wanting to cheat you out of yours. I know, Beth, that's the fair way to look at it, but all men don't feel that way. Those that don't are the ones I've got to look out for. When men are so selfish, it makes life just a big fight. Yes, Ben replied, and most every man is fierce to down every other one. It's just like a big school. You despise the bullies and sneaks, of course, but you've got to look out for them. I don't mean to leave a crack for a rascal to get the better of me in this business. I'd rather make forty blunders myself than to have someone jam me in the door. Don't you wish you knew whether you could get it or not? Yes, first catch your hair. Thunder! I wish I didn't have to wait till tomorrow. Waiting's the hardest thing in the world. The cousins slowly walked back on the beach where they had raced a half hour before. I'll let you know just as soon as I can, Ben said at parting. You gave me the idea, and who knows what'll come of it. End of chapter 1「II of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter 2. The Purchase. I'd like to speak to you in a matter of business. Ben's face flushed in spite of the effort he made to look unconcerned, and it vexed him that his voice trembled. The old man addressed surveyed the boyish figure before him. Business? he questioned. Yes, it's about the works. Well, what about them? I should think there'd be a good deal of lumber in the frame and bricks in the chimney. Yes, I suppose there is, but what's that to you? I want to know what you'll take for the whole concern as it stands. I suppose the lease you've got won't run forever. No, I guess it won't, Mr. Madge meditated for a moment. He needed money badly to finish a pet tunnel in his Bonanza Princess mine. The sum that Ben could give him would be a small one, he knew, but it would be better than nothing. As for the lease, the least said about that the better, he said to himself with a chuckle at his own wit. He sat down on a pile of boards and motioned to Ben to take a seat beside him. Then he hung his hooked cane on his left arm. How much did you have left after your father's affairs was settled up? Must have been quite a tidy little sum, I reckon. Ben had resolved not to furnish any information in regard to his finances, unless obliged to do so. There wasn't much left after the debts were paid, he replied. Didn't he give you all he had before he died? Yes. There wasn't anyone else to leave it to except my cousin Beth Morton, and my father knew that if he left her anything, Mr. Hodges would take it. And you don't mean to tell me till you paid his debts out in it? when you wasn't obliged to. 
Every last one of them, the boy said with emphasis. Well, Ben Ralston, you are an odd stick. He regarded his cane with a speculative air as though he were comparing it with Ben. Guess I must be getting the long homewards now, he added as he slowly rose. Ben was busily speculating upon his intentions. The old sharper means to find out exactly how much money I've got and then make a stand to get it all, he thought. He instantly decided to furnish the information himself. I've got just two hundred dollars, not a cent more, and my board's paid to the first of the month. So you see, I've got to get to work at once, he said. Mr. Madge resumed his seat. Make me an offer, he replied, with a shrewd glance at Ben from his watery eyes. That's my offer, all I've got. Hmm, little enough for this stuff. As he paused, Ben nerved himself for the hardest part of all, the disclosure of his object in buying the works. The temptation not to unfold his plan was very strong, but he resisted it. Lumber's tolerable high now, the old man continued, and it's bound to go higher for the years out. A remembrance of the lease urged him to close the bargain at once. But if you're smart enough to sell at a profit... Before we come to a settlement, Mr. Madge, Ben interrupted, I want to tell you of one reason I have in buying your property. I mean to work over the bricks and soot of the chimney and the ground for gold. The old man was visibly astonished. So... For gold. Well, that's another thing altogether, he remarked, as the instinct to get the better of a bargain demanded precedence over all others. Then a gleam of avarice shone in his eyes. Tell you what, boy, if you're anxious to mine, I can show you some splendid properties. He weighed this cane in his excitement. The place to look for gold is in a virgin mine, not in forty-year-old soot. I don't want any mine that can be bought for two hundred dollars, Ben said with decision and I must invest in something right off. I can't leave my offer open either, he added, as he saw the other make a move to go. If I don't buy your ruin, I'll have to get into something else. You are in a hurry, ain't you? I wish that I could persuade you to go into a mine. Tain't no use, eh? He added as Ben shook his head. Well, he rose stiffly, I'll see you tomorrow about it. Tomorrow will do. I'll meet you at the works at ten o'clock. I've got something on hand for the afternoon, Ben answered. When he was alone, the boy tried to formulate a plan of operation, should he succeed in buying the property. His most difficult task was to control his impatience. I suppose I'll have to do some more waiting, he said to himself. How I wish tomorrow were here. He knew as well as if Mr. Madge had told him so, that his statement in regard to his funds would not be believed without verification. He couldn't take my word for it, Ben reflected. But all his digging can't bring up anything more than the truth. It's just two hundred dollars, not a cent more. Shortly before ten o'clock on the following morning, Ben approached the works. He crossed the lumpy, uneven ground of the yard and entered the building. As he gazed at the black walls of the structure and through the many holes in the roof where the blue sky looked down, he wished that they might speak and foretell the success or failure of his venture. The side of the building next to the water was built upon piles driven into the beach, and through an opening in the wall he could see the waves running back and forth, until they almost touched the building. He was very much excited, and involuntarily he kept his hand over the pocket which held his money. The responsibility of the step he was about to take weighed heavily upon him. Never before had he felt so utterly alone in the world. His visionary father had been the one heretofore to whom he had naturally turned for advice, even when he felt grave doubts as to his judgment. Now he was about to risk all in a speculation which might yield no return. He was buoyant with hope, yet the doubt which always accompanies a first trial steadied him. A rope hung from one of the joists of the flooring, and he idly watched the waves wash it backward and forward. At another time he would have questioned the presence of a deep furrow and some footprints in the sand which the incoming tide was rapidly obliterating, but now he was too preoccupied to notice them. He turned and saw Mr. Madge entering the building. So, you got here for me, the old man began. It's a good thing to be prompt. I don't know of any one thing I like more in a young man than punctuality. Always practice it and you'll never be sorry for it. He deliberately seated himself. I recollect once, way back in the early fifties, how punctuality paid me in one of the pootiest minds that mortal man ever see. 
clear white quartz with lumps of yellow gold peppered all through it. It was this here way, he continued as he hung his cane on his arm. The mine belonged to a man who'd gone back east and hadn't touched a pick to it for most a year. So another man and me was both a-watchin' for the day when the year'd be up so we could take up the claim. Ben fidgeted during this recital, but the other did not appear to notice his impatience. The other feller, continued Mr. Madge, he got up at dawn, it was summertime, about three o'clock. But when he clam up the hill to the mine, there I was a-settin', having planted my claim two hours before. I had been there since midnight. He laughed at his story regardless of Ben's inattention. Another time, up in the Comstocks, this time I was just to telling you about was in Nevada County of this state, I recollect how being prompt saved a good mine and kept a hull concern from going to rack and ruin. T'was a silver mine, with beautiful green ores ever you see. But I'd like to know first, before I hear about it, Mr. Madge, whether you're going to accept my offer or not been interrupted, for he could no longer control his impatience. Well, I've been thinking over your offer, Ben, and I've about made up my mind that it ain't no price for the property, considering the gold that's lying hid on it. No price at all, in fact. But it's a chance whether I find any gold or not, Ben impatiently exclaimed. When you buy a mine, do you pay as much for it as you expect to get out of it? His heart sank with fear that his offer might not be accepted. He felt that he must meet the old man on his own ground, and he was on his mettle. It ain't much of a price for the building material that's in it, let alone the gold, Mr. Madge continued, as if he had not heard the question. I ain't willing to let it go at your figure, but I tell you what I'll do. I'll go shares with you. If you'll pay me the two hundred and put up the coin for the machinery, I suppose a rastra will do for the crushing. I don't care to take a partner, Ben firmly replied. His heart was growing heavier with every second that failure seemed more certain. He nerved himself for a final effort. If you don't care to accept my offer, Mr. Madge, there's no use wasting any more words over the matter, he said, and turned to go. A vindictive gleam shot from the old man's eyes. He did not reply for a moment, but stopped Ben as he was going out of the door. I need the money, he briefly said, so I'll take your offer, but I'm just a-giving it to you. Ben dived in his pocket with alacrity and produced a bill of sale for the lumber and bricks and also an agreement permitting him to work over the ground until the expiration of the lease. The dates of the latter he had omitted, as he did not know them. He had opened his purse to pay over the money before he recalled the omission. It flashed upon him, too, that the paper should be signed in the presence of witnesses. He put his purse back in his pocket. Come to Hodge's shop. We must have witnesses, Ben said. Mr. Hodges was a locksmith and owned a small shop in the old part of the city known as North Beach. He was Beth's stepfather, and she was Ben's cousin. The boy naturally turned to him as a friend. He looked up in surprise when his visitors entered and gave them a gruff welcome. Mr. Madge was in great haste to sign the papers and get possession of the money. The dates of the lease must be put in first, said Ben. What are they? Well, let me see, said Mr. Madge. It was thirty-five years ago, and we got it cause twasn't needed by the owners. Afterwards, it was made over to me by the company. That would make it 1866, said Ben. He lifted the pen. What was the month? Let me see, the other replied, as if striving to remember. We begun in November, I think. Yes, we drove the first pile for the foundation on the 15th day of November, 1866. He brought his cane down with a thump to emphasize the statement. I remember the time particularly because t'was in that same month that I made a fortune up in Tulum County. I own the pootiest mine on the mother load ever you see. I think you've told me about that before, Mr. Madge, Ben replied as he filled in the dates. Now, this paper gives me the sole right to work over the ground, bricks, and rubbish of the smelting works until the expiration of the lease. And that will be until... Ben waited for Mr. Madge to supply the rest of the sentence. Certainly it does, the latter said. You talk like a regular lawyer, Ben. Business is business. Now, as I understand it, the lease will expire on the 15th of November. That's three months off. The works are mine till then. They're yours until the lease expires, replied Mr. Madge, with considerable impatience. I'm ready to sign if you are. Let's get through with it. Ben passed the papers toward him and he affixed his signature. Ben followed with his and he turned to Hodges. Will you sign here, Mr. Hodges, he said. 
Yes, I'll sign the tomfoolery to oblige you, replied the locksmith. But before he put his name to the paper, he relieved his mind by making several sneering remarks. Talk about diamonds and coal being the same. Why, that won't be in it when it comes to finding gold and soot and bricks, he said. Then you'll be a regular, what do you call it, chemist? An alchemist? I hope so, Ben replied with flushed cheeks. We ought to have another witness, he added. A man who was examining some keys in the back part of the shop came forward. I'll sign if you want me to, he said. I heard the whole business. Couldn't help it. They agreed, and he wrote his name, Andrew Munden, in a good bold hand. Ben then paid Mr. Madge the coveted twenties, and the party separated. Ben was eager to make his escape. He shrank from the coarse sarcasm which he knew would be his share if he remained in the vicinity of the shop, and he wanted to be alone to think over the matter. Phew, I'm in for it now, he exclaimed as he strode along the street with a hand in each empty pocket. He threw back his head and stepped briskly along. And I want to tell you one thing right here, he addressed himself. There is to be no looking backward. He whistled a lively air and quickened his steps as exciting thoughts crowded fast upon him. Turning a corner suddenly, he collided with a boy of his own age. Hello, Sid. The boy addressed gave a grunt in reply. How do you like the place, Ben continued. Oh, it's well enough for a while. I've got another one at forty dollars a month in view. Indeed. How soon do you expect to make the change, Ben inquired. Oh, I ain't going to work for this money long, Sid aggressively replied, as though his employer were doing him an injury. I've had two offers. One will pay ten dollars more, but there's more work and longer hours. I haven't made up my mind yet which one I'll take. Doubt was plainly written in Ben's face. Sid always had some such rose-colored yarn as this to tell about himself. You're lucky to have two such good chances, Ben remarked. You have to look out and take the right one. He turned to go, but the other stopped him. What are you doing nowadays? Beth said something about your having a tip-top place. I don't think she could have said that, Sid. Yes, she did, too, or words to that effect. You don't mean to doubt my word, do you? He defiantly added. I'd rather not, Ben quietly replied. We fought all our lives on the slightest cause, and we're too old for that sort of thing now. I don't want to quarrel, but that's what she said. I don't see how that is possible, when I haven't any place at all. Haven't any? Ain't you working? Yes, I'm going to work, but for myself. It isn't a secret any longer, so you may as well know it, since you are so interested in my affairs. I have bought the old smelting works to work them for gold. Ben thoroughly enjoyed making this announcement. Between Sid and himself there had always been a rivalry, and after Sid's foolish bragging about something that both knew to be false, it was a satisfaction to Ben to impart his news. For gold, Sid repeated in surprise. Yes, for gold, and I expect to find a pile. Well, I hope you won't be disappointed. Just give me a lump to have set in a scarf pin, will you? He laughed in derision. All right, a small nugget will do, I suppose. I must be going now. Good morning. Sid gave a grunt in reply and slouched away. Tall and awkward, he thrust his head forward when he walked and kept his eyes fixed on the ground. Ben turned and watched him for a moment. How he would rejoice in my failure, he said to himself. It's odd that some people find their pleasure in just such things. Well, I hope he'll not have that joy at my expense, that's all. He regretted that he had yielded to the impulse to tell Sid. I wish I'd waited until I could have shown him the color of my gold, he reflected. Perhaps I shan't find a pinch of it. Glancing up, he saw that he had nearly reached Market Street, and obeying a sudden impulse, crossed the great artery and turned his steps toward the foundries. He was glad to have something to divert his thoughts from his interview with Sid, and he spent the rest of the day in looking at machinery, more especially that used in mining. The clash and clamor of the busy highs brought the difficulties of his undertaking glaringly before him. His own ignorance seemed appalling. How could he hope to compete with this skilled labor and wonderful machinery? I am not competing, he told himself. I am doing something which no one else has thought of. The idea is original, here at any rate, and ideas can be made to pay. End of chapter 2
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine, by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter 3. The Smuggler's Cash is Found. Suppose you're going to put in a rastra. Ben turned and saw the man who had signed as a witness to the agreement. How do you do, Mr. Mundin, he replied. Yes, I think it will need an arastra to crush the bricks. His grave face showed that already the cares of the undertaking were preying upon him. Don't you mind the sneers and the laughs of anybody, the man said, with a sturdy independence that Ben liked. You've got a good proposition. I've seen it done in Australia and a big pile cleaned up. They do it in this country, too, and if this old chap you bought it from didn't have the mining fever so bad, he'd have done it years ago. Evidently it hasn't occurred to him, or anybody, said Ben. No, he's too high to be a gleaner. Wants real mines with drifts and tunnels and mills to make his money melt. Now if I was going to do this job, I'd put in a rough rastra, just a round bed of bricks with a two-foot wall round it. Ben did not reply, but he tried to look wise. That's about your plan, I reckon. Yes, the boy said. I've been thinking that an arastra such as you describe would be the best thing. Then you know all about one, of course. No, I don't, not by a long sight. I've seen one at work, but I didn't pay much attention to it. I was so young at the time. Oh, in that case, perhaps you'd like to have me describe one to you. I would indeed, Ben fervently replied. Well, it's just a round bed of bricks with a two-foot wall round it. I'd build that the first thing if I was you and put in the rubbish a little at a time. You want to put in some quicksilver with it. Then I'd get a horse or a mule to drag round a weight till the bricks and mortar was well crushed. Would you put the stuff in wet or dry? Wet, and you want considerable water too. I tell you, it's pretty to see how the quicksilver will pick up most every mite of gold and hug to the bottom with it. Ben's eyes shone. It must be, he said. And afterwards, what do you do next? I've heard, but I've kind of forgotten just what comes next. You throw off your coarse stuff from the top and strain the quicksilver through buckskin. Will it go through? Will it? Well, you just ought to see it come through the buckskin till there's little looking glass tears all over it. And after that? Well, you finish it all off in a retort with a long tube. Build a fire under it, and your quicksilver that's left will evaporate, leaving the gold behind. I should think you'd lose a lot. A quicksilver, you mean? No, you don't, because you got to keep the tube cold and have the end of it sunk in water. Then the quicksilver will condense again, so you won't lose much of it. My, how them lumps of gold will shine to you, eh? The boy's eyes sparkled with delight, but he only nodded. He was thinking very hard. Here evidently was just the man he needed. He had seen an arastra at work in one of his father's mines, but he knew nothing about the practical details necessary to the construction of one. Should he offer to employ this man, or should he offer him a percentage of the profits? The latter proposition seemed more feasible, for although it might cost him more in the end, he had no ready money to pay out in wages. His mind was quickly made up. I tell you what I'll do, Mr. Munden. If you'll help me with the scheme, I don't mean just by talking, but with day's work, I'll give you one-third of the net proceeds. That's a square offer, seeing as how I ain't got nothing to put in, and I'll take it. I'm out of a job just now, through waiting for a friend from Australia. I expect he'll be here in a month more, or maybe twill be several, and then we'll try Colorado together. I'd really like this work to fill up the time. There's something sort of venturesome about it that appeals to me. I'm very glad to get you to help me, Ben replied. I've been worrying a good deal since I bought it. I thought of it a little myself, and I come out here today because I kind of thought I'd find you a hanging round somewhere near this place. Let's go in and look over the ground, said Ben. They entered the enclosure and Munden selected the most suitable place for the arastra. The next question is, where am I to get the money for the things we need, Ben remarked. I could get them on credit, I think, from an old mining friend of my father's, but I hate to go in debt, especially on an uncertainty. I've been thinking about offering him a small percentage in exchange for the materials, Then it would be his own risk whether he got his money or not. Pshaw! You don't want to give away any more percentages. A man's got to go in debt, more or less, in most every business. Besides, your money's right in sight, 
as it were. No, it isn't, Ben stoutly replied. That's just the trouble. I think it is, but I don't know it. What right have I to promise to pay a man out of my thinking? There ain't any other way. You've just got to do it, or borrow the money from someone else which amounts to the same thing. He paused for a reply, but as he noticed Ben's hesitation, he hastened to divert him from his weighing of right and wrong. I recollect a chimney on one of Senator Fair's mills up in Nevada that yielded a pile of gold and silver when t'was broke up. Why, they found one solid lump of silver half as big as my fist in a crack in the masonry. You see, the gold what stays in the furnaces works right into the mortar and bricks in a dust so fine you can't see it. That's why you need a rastra. But sometimes, fine particles of precipitated silver get blown into a crack until there's a big lump formed. They peered up the gaping black mouth of the chimney. The furnaces had been roughly torn out and large openings marked where they had joined the chimney. Tell you what, Ben exclaimed Munden, suppose I skin up and see what I can see. No, let me go, the boy eagerly replied. He was a trifle ashamed of the jealousy he had already begun to feel of this man's wider experience. If there were lumps of gold and silver glittering in his chimney, he wanted to be the first to see them. It's a dirty job, but I've gone on old clothes, he said as he began to climb up the black funnel. Somehow it was not nearly so sooty as he'd expected to find it, and the projecting corners of the bricks that afforded him a slight foothold were quite light-colored. He had climbed about ten feet when he saw a curious cavity in the side of the chimney. The glitter in the dim light made his heart beat very fast. Striking a taper match, he was surprised to see a pile of small tin boxes nearly filling a cavity in the side of the chimney. Looking upward, he saw several similar breaks in the brickwork. He took one of the boxes and climbed down. "'What have you got?' cried Munden, with more surprise in his voice than gave great credit to the tale he had just recounted. They bent over the box, which emitted a sickishly sweet odor. "'Opium!' Munden exclaimed. For a moment they looked at each other in silent astonishment. Then Ben grasped Munden's arm and dragged him to the gap in the side of the building next the water. It's been smuggled, he cried, and here's where they've landed the boats. He pointed to the beach at their feet. The waves were still playing with the dangling rope's end. Was there any more, questioned Munden. Whole stacks of it. Then you've got all the money you're in need of many times over. Right in sight this time, sure. How so? Why, don't you know that the law gives an informer 33% of the value of the fine? Of course it does. All you got to do is to notify the custom house men of the find and they'll do the rest. You think it's been landed here, don't you? asked Ben. Sure, it's been landed from the China steamer, sure as you're born. There couldn't have been a better place for them if it had been made on purpose. Probably they muffled their oars before they landed. It isn't ten minutes row from the steamer, said Ben. No, like as not the butcher or someone like that after the ship's trade is one of the gang. You've seen the flock of small boats that follow like gulls after a big ocean steamer? Ben nodded. He was stupefied with surprise. His good fortune seemed too good to be true. Tell you what, Ben. Like as not those custom house fellers who want to leave the stuff here and set a watch to catch the gang. I don't care what they do, if I can get the money. You can't believe it yet, eh? I tell you, you're just as sure of that there money as if you had it in your pocket this minute. It's like magic. So tis, so tis. Tis the bag at the foot of a rainbow, sure enough. He pointed at the massive shaft of the chimney. Fairy gold, Ben waved the little box at Munden. That's all right. You'll find out that the gold you get for that's as good as twenty dollar pieces are made of. Want me to go down and inform, or prefer to do it yourself? I'll go. Just as you say, you're a boss here. You found it in your property, and it's proper you should go. I'll stay and keep watch. End of chapter 3。Chapter 4 of The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine, by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter 4. Funds for the Enterprise. 
Ben's first impulse was to go home and change his clothes, which showed the contact of dust and soot, but it was past three o'clock, and he was afraid if he did not make haste he would not see the proper authorities. He stopped at Hodge's shop to wash his face and hands. Mr. Hodges was fitting a key to a metal box. Hello, he remarked, as Ben hurried past him to the rear of the shop. You look as if you've found your fortune already. Maybe I have, Ben replied. I'll let you know when I've verified the find. Mr. Hodge stared. He had a lurking suspicion that he was being made game of. A young feller always knows it all, he commented. He's always so cocksure. Wonder if I am that way, thought Ben as he pursued his way down the street. Anyway, I'd rather fail than never have been through it. There's something doing and I'm in it. He was so preoccupied as he hurried along that once he narrowly escaped being run down by a whizzing electric car. The prospect opening before him fairly made him dizzy with delight. He felt that he had suddenly become a man, and dimly wondered how it was possible that a month before he had played shinny and peewee with the other boys, as if there was nothing else to live for. And now he had gone into business. He would succeed. He must succeed. Mingled with his delight at his sudden good luck, there was a feeling of relief that he had resisted the temptation to go into debt. At length he came in sight of the custom house, a dilapidated brick building, the first floor of which was used as the main post office. Ben slowly climbed the winding stone stairs. He suddenly wanted more time than the elevator would allow to think of how he should tell his story. After a short delay he was ushered into the presence of the collector of the port. Ben explained his plan and his accidental discovery of the opium. He fancied that the official, and a gentleman who was sitting in the room, seemed to be much more interested in his scheme to work over the bricks and rubbish of the old smelting works for gold than they were in the discovery of the opium. He noted that the visitor was addressed as Mr. Hale, and he wondered if he were the well-known lawyer of whom he had heard. This gentleman asked Ben several questions in relation to his plan, and although his eyes and voice were kind, the boy's sensitive spirit shrank under the tone of the questioner. The amusement in his eyes seemed to foretell the failure of the venture. The attention of the chief being called to other matters, he sent for a deputy to whom he referred Ben's case. This official also appeared to be much interested in Ben's private affairs and plied him with questions, some of which were apparently irrelevant. Nettled, he knew not why, by the man's manner and questions, Ben finally asserted himself. I bought the property to work over for what I could get out of it, he said. By accident I found a lot of opium hidden on the premises, and I expect to get the 33% which the law allows. The look which accompanied this speech said plainer than words, Now, what are you going to do about it? Mr. Cutter meditatively regarded the speaker. We'll set a watch there tonight and catch some of the gang if we can, he finally remarked. You're a pretty smart boy, he brought his hand down on Ben's shoulder. Can you keep a secret? Ben nodded. See that you do, then, and caution the friend who was with you to tell no one, absolutely no one. Such news goes like wildfire. We wouldn't be apt to tell and run the risk of losing the reward. Hmm. Some folks couldn't keep a secret if their lives depended upon it. That's all, he curtly added. When I want you, I'll send for you. Without knowing why, Ben mistrusted this man. Cutter is your name, and I shan't forget you, he said to himself, as he retraced his steps to North Beach. Munden was anxiously awaiting his return. Did they snub you? Did you see the head? he asked. Ben related his experience. You are in luck to see the collector, commented Munden. My belief is that the chief's all right in such cases, a big man who won't stoop to no dirty business and who'll listen to a feller's story and treat him fair. He's got a sense of what he's been put in office for, by the people to serve the people but a smarty clerk who takes delight in snubbing the people who really give him his bread and butter, deliver me from him. He's generally a failure, a ne'er-do-well who's got his place through his second cousin's husband having a pull, and because he couldn't support himself and had to be taken care of by his family, and he just thinks he runs the whole government. They'll be here about dark, I suppose, Ben remarked. I'm going to watch too. Well, I think I'll be excused, Munden remarked. In my opinion, there ain't one chance in a hundred of their catching them. Why shouldn't they catch them if they come back here for the opium? Ben innocently inquired. 
Why, boy, there's more plaguey ramifications to a gang like that. From what you've told me, it wouldn't surprise me to find that this man Cutter's in it himself. Most likely every move you've made has been known to him, and they'd have taken the stuff away if they got a chance. All that night the Custom House men kept a watch at the works. Ben watched with them, looking off on the waters of the bay and listening for the dip of muffled oars. More than once he fancied he heard the smugglers approaching, and his heart beat fast as he waited to be sure before calling the men. He felt a great distaste for his position, and correctly attributed Munden's refusal to join in the watch to the same reason. When morning dawned, he experienced a distinct relief that nothing had occurred during the night to place him in the position of an informer. End of chapter 4「5 of the Golden Chimney, a Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, a Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter 5. Ben's Partner Proves a Trump. The watch was continued for several nights, but in vain. As none came to claim the opium, it was taken away and a valuation of $2,000 was placed upon it, of which Ben's share amounted to nearly $700. It did not seem possible that those little boxes, filled with a sticky substance which looked like very black and thick molasses, could be worth so much. The readiness with which a broker advanced Ben the money due on his claim, however, was tangible evidence, and he found no fault with the exorbitant rate of interest exacted. There was one phase of the affair that was most unpleasant to Ben, the suspicion with which the government officials regarded Munden and himself. Someone blabbed, one of them pointedly said to him, or else the parties who stowed that stuff away would have come back for it. Another time he overheard one man remark to another, I don't agree with you. I think the boy's honest enough, but that fellow with him looks like a slippery one. But the boy's the one who gets the reward. I know but that fellow will get it out of him before he's through with him. A thought that this might be true came into Ben's mind, but he dismissed it at once as unworthy. Yet it is hard to get rid of a vicious weed, and this doubt presented itself to him from time to time. Munden proved more useful to Ben as time went on, and his own ignorance and inexperience became more marked. He congratulated himself many times upon the good luck which had sent this man across his path. Gee, Willikins, Munden, how are we ever going to get this chimney down? Ben looked up at the massive pillar of brick which reared itself above him. It looks about a mile high when you stand close to it. Why, he added with a blank look, it'll take us months to level it. You is it calculating to level it? Munden laconically asked. Of course, how else can we work over the bricks that are in it? Hmm, how'd you think you'd get it down? Well, that's what's worrying me. I had a sort of plan to scrape down the soot, but the bricks, how are we going to get at them? Your ID is good, as far as it goes, but I think I can give you a better one than scraping the chimney of soot. Let's have it. I'd rig a cross piece, shaped just like a cross, to work inside the chimney from a rope over the top like an elevator. Ben caught his breath. How would you ever get a rope over the top, he asked. Oh, that's easy. I haven't been a sailor for nothing. Then I chip off the whole inside of the chimney. We'd work just the inside. That's all we want, ain't it? It's the golden lining we're after. We don't want the rest. No, and it will save time and strength to leave the rest alone. We'll leave the balance of the bricks for those that come after us. It won't hurt the chimney a mite neither. Munden, you're a brick, exclaimed Ben. Munden waited a moment before replying. He liked the frank admiration that shone in Ben's eyes. There ain't nothing sure in this world, Ben, and it's mighty uncertain sometimes to draw conclusions from things you've been told. What's more, you can't believe all you hear. You're preparing me to be disappointed, Munden said Ben, but I'm bracing myself for that too. I know it's a chance. Most everything is, except running a peanut stand near a monkey's cage. Ben laughed. How are you ever going to get a rope over that top? He looked up and shook his head in despair. No fear, I'll manage that. 
Just let me get some stuff for a scaffolding, and I'll show you the trick in a jiffy. You're a wonder, Ben replied. The question as to what he should have done without Munden's help occurred to him again, but he did not express it. I heard when I was up town this morning that there was going to be a sale of mules tomorrow. You think we'll need one to work the arastra? Couldn't have nothing better. This sale's going to be at a horse market out near Potrero. Suppose you see if you can get one cheap. Yes, I'll go to the sale, Ben paused. I say, Munden, what is cheap for a mule? About fifteen dollars ought to get one good enough at an auction. That was about the figure I had in mind. Of course, I don't ask your opinion, Munden, so much to get advice as I do to compare notes. I like to see if your judgment and mine agree. Munden did not look up, but went steadily on with his work. I understand, of course, he replied. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding Chapter 6, The Mule Auction A mule is very much like a horse, isn't it, Ben questioned on the following morning. Yes, they are somewhat similar, Munden replied, going on with the task of untangling some old harness. Yet they're different, too. That's so, they are. Ben did not like to admit his ignorance, but he very much desired some further information on the subject of mules before he entered the arena of the auction. He had a guilty consciousness that he had made Munden feel that he had resented his superior wisdom in many things connected with their undertaking, and that he was unreasonably jealous of his worldly knowledge. He regretted and was ashamed of his ingratitude towards this man who had proved invaluable to him, and he hoped that the other would overlook it. If you were going to buy a horse, Munden, what particular points would you look for in the animal? Well, I see that he had a broad forehead, good straight clean legs, round hooves, small ears, clear eyes, and most of all a wide chest. But of course these don't hold good in a mule. No, I suppose not. Then he ought to be in good proportion. I have seen horses with fine-looking front and back all shrunk up. And I've seen some with a fine back and front that had a stunted look. An animal like that ain't apt to have much strength or wearing qualities. Then there's exceptions. I remember one of the best horses for pulling I ever saw had a sort of stunted front. But of course none of these things hold good in a mule. No, nothing seems to apply to a mule. Ben picked up a strap which dangled from the harness and began untangling it. Haven't the teeth something to do with it? Sure, they're the most important point, because that's the way you can tell a horse's age, by his teeth. If they're long, he's old. You want to see that they ain't been filed, too. Do you think the point about the teeth would apply to a mule, Ben asked? There ain't nothing that applies to a mule except patience. You've got to have everlasting patience when you come near a mule. But they're knowing. Lordy, I've had him teaming up in the mountains when they knew a sight more than most men. I talked to him just like they was humans. Sal, I'd say, don't you know better than to hug so close to that bank? And before the words was out of my mouth, Sal would be a standing way off from the bank. And all I had to do to get one of them over the chain, as a chain runs between them in place of a pole, you know, and maybe I'd have sixteen or twenty strung along in pairs and if I wanted to get one of them over it, I'd just call out the name, and that mule would jump the chain quick as lightning. A horse has got a heap of sense, but in my opinion, a mule can discount him every time. We're safer, then, in buying a mule than a horse. La, yes. For the work you want done, you are. Well, I'll be going along, I guess, remarked Ben. I want to look over the field before the sale begins. That'd be a good idea. Ben boarded an electric car which crossed the city. He was dubious as to his ability for the task he had undertaken, and regretted that he had not asked Munden to go in his place. He ran over the directions for buying a horse. Round-hoofed, small-eared, broad-headed, clear-eyed, short-teeth, clean-legged, wide-chest, and good proportion, he enumerated. I'm prime for a horse sale, if I ever need to go to one, but I'm all at sea about a mule. Munden had seemed to be singularly averse to offering to make the purchase, Ben reflected, 
although he had been given ample opportunity to do so, and he was so well qualified to select exactly the animal needed. He had appeared anxious to get Ben out of the way. Could it be possible that he meant to make the attempt to get the rope over the top of the chimney during his absence? How would he manage it? It seemed a colossal, impossible task. The car clanged its bell along Tierney Street, whizzed across Market and swung into 3rd Street, on its way to the Petrero. A wild idea occurred to Ben. If there's a mule in the enclosure that points his ears at me, I'll buy him, he decided. Association with his father had implanted superstition in the boy's character. Ben had seen it sway his father many times, as indeed it exerted an influence more or less potent upon all miners. A recollection of the sum he had resolved to expend reminded Ben that the occult must be confined within the limits of fifteen dollars. I don't know the first thing about it, anyway, and I might as well be guided by chance as anything else, he reflected. He was a trifle ashamed of this decision, and half hoped that the mules themselves would render its execution impossible, by all laying back or all pointing their ears in unison. When he entered the gate of the vacant lot where the sale was to be held, a rough-haired, forlorn-looking specimen of a mule raised two weather-beaten ears and disconsolately surveyed him. That settles it, said Ben to himself. After all, it's something to have the matter decided for one. The man in charge was anxious to show Ben the superior animals within the enclosure, but he manifested so little interest in them that their owner began to have doubts as to his being a bona fide purchaser. Like as not, the rest will all go above my price, thought Ben. But I think I can get to spare, for so he had designated the mule he had settled upon, for fifteen. It was a long wait, and Ben was anxious to return to the works, but the owner seemed to be in no hurry to begin, and evidently was waiting for a larger audience. When a dozen or more men had arrived, the sale was open. It was confusing, the way in which the auctioneer rattled on, discovering invisible buyers in corners and on the outskirts of the crowd. Ben wondered how he should be able to keep his head when his time should come, and he realized that this thought made his heart beat rapidly. He witnessed some close buying that was bewildering to the inexperienced, and he saw one man badly kicked by the glossiest, plumpest mule in the lot. Another mark in favor of despair, Ben noted. You can't tell anything by looks, but I don't believe he'd do that. It was late in the afternoon before the mule which Ben had selected, or rather the mule which had selected Ben, was offered. We'll start him at... What do we start him at, gentlemen? Five dollars, said a voice. Five dollars, the auctioneer scornfully repeated. Somebody here expects to get a good work in animal for nothing just because his coat's a little rough. Five dollars would just be a giving him away. Why, all he needs to be a playmate for the children is a clippin' and a red ribbon tied round his tail. What am I bid, 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 what am I bid? Ten dollars, young man, did you say? He pointed to Ben and the latter nodded. Here's a young gentleman who knows a good animal for the saddle when he sees one. This sally brought a laugh from the crowd and added to Ben's discomfiture. Ten dollars! Who'll raise the bid? Twelve! He pointed to a man on the edge of the group. Who'll give me twelve dollars for this reliable mule? Twelve dollars? Fifteen, said Ben. A smile rippled over the faces of the crowd, and Ben became painfully conscious that he had made an error. He could feel his face growing uncomfortably warm. Fifteen dollars, called the auctioneer. Will no one raise it? Is there no one here wants this mule more than this young gentleman? Fifteen once, fifteen twice, fifteen three times, and sold to... He turned expectedly toward Ben. Mr. Ralston, said Ben. The money was paid, and Ben started for the works with his purchase. You must have wanted that mule powerful bad, young feller, the bystander remarked as the pair issued from the gate. Think so? the boy replied, anxious to make his escape. Yes, it rather looks as though you did. To wait till the last and worst-looking mule in the bunch was offered, the man continued, and then to raise your own bid twice? There was a laugh from the crowd. You could have got him for twelve dollars, sure, and you might have got him for ten. Well, that's my affair, Ben retorted. He led the mule along a street in the direction of the city, not without a misgiving, however, as to the docility of the animal. He feared that he might balk or suddenly whirl and kick, to the amusement of the spectators, made Ben eager to increase the distance between the mule market and himself. 
It was a long distance from the Portrero to North Beach, where they marked opposite boundaries of the city, and Ben had ample opportunity for reflection. He made a detour and skirted the seawall in order to avoid the more crowded streets. As he trudged along, the mule seemed docile and easily led, but Ben bought some carrots from a passing vegetable wagon to make assurance doubly sure. He regretted that he had yielded to the impulse of trusting to chance. He was conscious that the act was unworthy and degrading, that he had taken a step backward. If I'm going to act in that fool way, he said to himself, there's no telling where I'll land. It's as bad as the things Tom Sawyer did. Worse, because he didn't trust an important piece of business to black art. It's just the kind of thing that the lowest order of a Negro would be capable of. But no one knows it, he added with emphasis, nor ever shall. Despair and I can keep the secret. That name won't do. It might hoodoo the scheme. He turned and reflectively surveyed the mule. You've got to have a name that's a winner, a cheerful, humming, booming sort of name, he said. As if in reply, the animal raised his long ears and pointed them at his interlocutor. When they reached Montgomery Avenue, where Mr. Hodge's shop was situated, Ben pulled his hat over his eyes. He endeavored to hasten the pace of the mule. In this he was unsuccessful, but fortunately there was no one in sight whom he knew. If I were sure of success, I wouldn't mind the whole town seeing every move I make, the boy reflected, but it makes a heap of difference in people's opinions whether you succeed or not. If you don't, then you're looked upon as a fool, and everything you've done is fool business. But if you do, then you're called wise, and everything you've done is smart as lightning. They reached the slight rise and began to descend toward the bay. Outlined against the vista of the blue water washing the base of the Sausalito Hills, rose the massive pillar of the chimney. Ben paused an instant in amazement. Munden had been true to his word, for reaching from the top to the bottom was a cable that looked the thickness of a thread against the solid brown bulk of the chimney. Ben could hardly believe his eyes. How had it been accomplished? He was obliged to control his impatience until the mule's deliberate gait brought them at length to the works. Munden, where are you? Ben called as he dashed into the building. Ahoy there! voice replied from the flue. Peering up the mouth, Ben saw Munden on a crosspiece which was fashioned by two lines to the main rope, after the manner of a trapeze. I'll do the chippin', Munden remarked from his perch about twenty feet from the ground. Take your head away a minute, and we'll drive the first blow. Ben retreated, and Munden struck the chisel he held a blow that sent down a shower of soot, broken brick, and mortar. We'll soon know now, Ben said to himself, and his heart beat rapidly when he thought of all it meant to him. End of chapter 6「Seven of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine – by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter 7. Building the Arastra. We've got to find a place to keep the mule. It's too cold to leave him outside, said Ben. That's easy, Munden replied. One of the sheds will do first rate. We'll have a box stall, same as a racer. I'll fix it up for him right now. He looks sort of forlorn, tied out there in the fog, said Ben. There's two other animals we ought to find quarters for, too. Two others? Oh, you mean ourselves? Yes, with all this room going to waste, why shouldn't we get our room rent free? That's a good idea, Munden. We'll have to do it or hire a watchman as soon as we begin to work the stuff. We might as well get used to it first as last. I'll build the room for us. Over there against that east wall would be a good place for it. Perhaps there won't be anything to need watching, Ben said with a grim smile, but we'll soon know now. There's got to be something. It ain't in reason that there ain't no gold left over in all this mess, emphatically replied the other. Well, we'll hope so, till we know to the contrary. We'll have to have some furniture, I suppose. Furniture? Why, a couple of beds, anyway. Oh, I'll knock up a couple of bunks that'll do for the time we'll be here. I can make first-rate armchairs, too, regular sleepy haulers out of those barrels. That'd be fine. I suppose we'd better use the boards out of that first shed? No, I'd put the mule in that one. Then he'd be further away from our quarters. I'll knock down the second shed, 
the one where the roof is half gone. Found a name yet for your mule? I've named him Alchemist. Alchemist? Don't that mean turning no count things into gold? Yes. Well, that's appropriate, as the work the rastra. Then we can call him Alki, till we know the result. And if we don't get anything worth mentioning out of it, we can call him Mist. That'd be appropriate, too. Alki goes, then, and here's to be his home. I think I'll leave one window for his professorship. We'll separate his apartments from ours. He struck the dilapidated shed a blow as he spoke. "'Twill be more aristocratic,' observed Munden. "'Suppose I start the rastra while you're doing that?' "'Wish you would. Everything seems unimportant. "'Where we sleep or where the mule sleeps compared to the real business. "'A man's got to be comfortable, or he can't do good work. "'This here's the best place for the rastra.' "'He took several long steps across a spot in the center of the floor. "'I'll level this off a little, so to have the floor of it even.' They're going to use those bricks? Ben pointed to some bricks which marked the location of the furnaces. I was calculating to. But first we've got to remember that we've got to have a furnace too. We have? What for? Why, we've got to melt our gold after we get it. Oh, well, why not leave that part of the old furnace that's standing there? I was thinking of doing that. We'll build a rough chimney on the outside. Then we'll have to have a crucible. Yes, that's another thing I was going to mention. Ever seen it done, gold melting into one? Yes, I've been watching them do it in Smith's assay office. Oh, you have, have you? Yes, and the other day I went to the Mint and saw a lot. Mr. Hale, the gentleman I met at the Custom House, gave me a card. It's funny, Munden, how different everything there looked to me from the last time I was there. Every schoolboy in this town goes, and of course I went but it didn't seem to me that I could be the same boy who'd been there. Everything interested me so much more this time. Munden had been marking a circle in the center of the floor. Now, Ben, he said, we're ready for the cornerstone, and you're the proper person to lay it. You just get one of those bricks and put it here. He struck the center of the circle a blow with his spade. I didn't know you could corner a circle, said Ben, as he placed a brick upon the spot indicated. You can corner anything if you only find out how to do it. There, he added with satisfaction, the first brick's laid. Now she'll go a hummin'. Let me help you, said Ben. It's more interesting than building the mule shed. I can fix that by and by. All right. Munden watched Ben lay the bricks. How clumsy I am, the latter exclaimed when the bricks refused to lie evenly. I've often watched bricklayers at work. It looks as easy as breathing, but it isn't, not by a long sight. It's a trade, Munden laconically remarked. Then you must be the jack of them all, said Ben, for there's nothing you can't do. I've been in most of them. It's mean to try to do things when you don't know how. Sometimes a job I wasn't used to would take a powerful long time, though in the first stages. I thought it was working mighty fast, a regular lightning striker. Of course, anything that isn't regular work takes longer. Exactly. The more you work at a thing the more skillful you get. Sometimes, when I get through with a new worrisome job, I'd wonder what I'd better tackle next. And it would always remind me of a story my mother used to tell me about a tailor who was a powerful slow worker, but thought he was lightning. He took a whole week to make a vest, and then said, What'll I fly at next? During the following two weeks, the partners were very busy. The arastra was finished and the furnace in readiness for the precious metals. Lastly, a pile of soot, brick dust, and mortar, representing a part of the lining of the chimney, and a retort and some quicksilver awaited the trial. A fairly good sleeping room with a tiny galley adjoining made the place comfortable. Munden proved to be a good cook, and Ben was fond of watching him at his culinary labors. The kitchen was constructed like the galley of a ship, and when the cook was seated, everything was within his reach. I've been camping out in vacations, Ben remarked, but this beats that all to pieces. It's cause this combines business with pleasure, Munden replied as he neatly cut long fingers of potato preparatory to frying them. There's twice as much fun to be had in doing the work you really like to do than there is in anything that's called fun. So I found out. Fun's like society. When it hunts you, comes of its own accord natural-like, it's fine. 
but when you hunt it, it don't amount to shucks. I guess you're about right. I know I've never enjoyed anything in my life as I have this. Because why? Because it's work you like. That's the reason. But it takes some folks a lifetime to find that out, and even then they don't see it. Ben was looking at the pile of rubble as if fascinated. How much longer before we know? It won't be long now, I reckon. Oh, Munden, how can I ever wait? On the following morning, Munden went downtown to make some necessary purchases. I heard something today, he said when he returned, that I wish I'd known in the beginning. What's that, inquired Ben. Why, you see, when I was inquiring about the price of Quicksilver, I ran up against a man as knew all about this sort of thing, or said he did. Of course, I didn't tell him our plan, but what he says is needed for it is a jigger. A what? A jigger machine. I got him to describe it, and I think I've got enough idea as to how it's made to make one myself. He'd used one up in Nevada, he said. Munden extracted a piece of chalk from his pocket, and on the board wall he drew a plan of the machine. Your jigger is a box made of wood, he said. Well, really it's a tank, six foot long by four high. You fill it with water. At one end you have a tray filled with dirt and hung from a pole which is balanced by a weight at the end. The other end of the pole works up and down like the handle of a bellus. The tray is dipped into the tank and all the loose dirt is washed out and the gold sinks to the bottom. That's the coarse gold. You've got to catch the fine gold on a table in the tank under the tray. The waste dirt works into the fur part of the tank. This man says, and he seems to know what he's talking about, that you can't get the valuable particles know-how without a jigger. What luck you were in to meet him. Wasn't I, though? I believe I'll get the lumber, it ought to be made out of new lumber, and knock the thing together this afternoon, Munden replied as he walked to the rear wall of the building. Say, Ben, he remarked, picking up a little of the earth from the floor and letting it sift through his fingers, I think we ought to locate our find a little before we begin operations. What do you mean? Why, this here place is like a ruin deserted by the folks who used to live here. For instance, he pointed to some grass-covered excavations. These were the furnaces. Well, said Ben thoughtfully, then if they followed the process used in all smelting works, the bullion was melted in crucibles and cast into bars. Exactly. Then just use your natural sense and think out how they got the bars to the bullion room. Why, they piled them on hand cars and run them up on a track. He suddenly knelt down and ran his hand along the ground in front of the excavations. Here's the groove where the track was laid. Sure as you're born. Ben dropped beside him. There is a groove, he cried. We're regular detectives, Munden. He couldn't run anywhere else, the other said, as if to himself. Then to the bullion room? Of course, it couldn't, and it didn't. It ran over there, didn't it? Ben pointed to the opposite wall. Yes, said Munden, it must. My, they were careless in those days. If this was like any smelting works ever, I see, and I suppose it was. They just slung the stuff round like it was mud. They always counted on losing lots of it and splashing. I should think so, with no flooring in the furnace rooms and all this dust being trampled into the earth floor year after year, I should think they'd have lost a fortune. Maybe they did. We hope so, for they made enough as it was. You see, sometimes a furnace would get to leaking. Well, maybe it would be quite a while before anybody found it out. Then perhaps they'd run tons of base bullion into a trench, thinking they'd go over the ground when they got time. Hmm. Well, sometimes they never got the time. They were so busy making money. We must look round sometime for traces of a trench of that sort. I've got an idea, said Ben, that it would be a good plan to wash the soil here and there with an ordinary gold pan. We could tell something, I should think, about where the richest dirt lay then. Twouldn't do no harm, but the richest dirt is bound to be near the furnaces and in the bullion room. We'll finish with the chimney first, because if there are any nuggets, they'll be there. Wouldn't any tin pan do? Oh, you better have the real thing. I see one a-hanging up outside a junk shop on Stockton Street that I'll get when I go to get the lumber. Maybe it might be a relic of 49 and give you some of the spirit of those days. Not that you ain't got the true mind and spirit already, he added with a glance at Ben's eager face. On the following day the pan was purchased, and Ben was initiated and became for the first time a real miner. 
He scooped some dirt from what was thought to be a favorable spot, put it in the pan, and poured some water upon it. Munden showed him how to shake the pan from side to side, allowing a little water to flow constantly from the top, until a small amount of very ordinary-looking dirt remained in the bottom. It was exhilarating to think of what it might contain. It looks exactly like the mud pies my mother's boy used to make, said Ben with an anxious air. There's a little color there where I'm mistaken, Munden wisely remarked as he scanned the sediment. Yellow's the color I'm looking for. Well, there's some yellow in that. Hold it up to the light. Now it does shine. I'll be hanged if it don't. Goodness knows. I want to see it as much as anyone, said Ben, but I'm afraid this is too much like imagination. It reminds me of the time people thought they saw flying machines in the sky. Munden shook his head. I ain't that kind, he remarked as he returned to his work of constructing the jigger. After all, he continued, you can't tell much about it till you make the experiment in the proper way. This machine will settle it one way or the other. He worked rapidly and skillfully, and by the following night the jigger was completed. My, he exclaimed as he drove the last nails. It was luck, blind luck, my meeting that feller and his telling me just exactly what I wanted to know. One thing will be very funny, said Ben. I was just thinking that we'll have to ship our bullion, when we get it, up to the Sirby smelting works at Vallejo to be resmelted and cast into bars. They were the original owners of it. Funny enough for us, Munden replied, but I don't count on shipping them any. How will we get it into bars? I'll get it into bars myself. You didn't know that I was an assayer too, did you? No, Ben thoughtfully replied. I think I've found my trade at last. Munden, if I've got brains enough, I'll be an assayer. Why not a mining engineer? Might as well aim for the highest while you're about it. That's so, but that takes more money. If I get enough out of this, I'll try for it. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter Eight, Gold in the Jigger. It's nearly time for us to know about where we stand, remarked Munden as he flung several shovelfuls of mortar, brick dust, and soot into the jigger. He then added some quicksilver to the mass. There, I guess that'll do for this time. Now we'll churn the cream and see if we can get any butter. Perhaps it isn't cream, Ben suggested, more to hear Munden reassure him than anything else. No, perhaps it ain't, perhaps it's only skim milk. Well, in that case we won't get any butter. But I'm a-betting on its being cream. When Munden took some of the amalgam from the dirty water and washed it clean, Ben knew that the time of reckoning had arrived. Ain't feeling faint, are you, Ben? Munden facetiously inquired. I heard her brought some smelling salts along. Well, I've got a ticklish sort of feeling myself. He placed the amalgam in a piece of buckskin. This he squeezed until the larger part of the quicksilver had been pressed through the skin. He did not tell Ben, but he knew from long experience that the result was satisfactory. Ben read his thoughts in his face. Tell me it's all right, Munden. I can see by your face that it is, but I'd like to hear you say it. Tell me. There's gold in this ball, or I'm not alive, the other replied. Wow! Ben flung his cap among the rafters, and seizing the ball of amalgam, he sent it after the cap. Here, young feller, don't go plumb crazy. That's heavy. Want to kill us? Give me that ball. I ain't through with it yet. Ben returned the ball. I had to let off steam or bust, he said. Now we'll see what we'll see, said Munden, as he repeated the process he had followed with the first handful of amalgam until he had three good-sized lumps. The gold's inside of them, Ben asked. Of course it is. It is we've reason to suppose so. How ever are we going to get it out? I say, Munden, I'd have made a pretty fizzle of this business without you. You'd have had to find somebody else, that's all, Munden modestly replied. Next, I take the retort, see that it's cold, and chalk it well. Watch me, Ben. Most anybody can set an egg on end after they've seen it done. Next, 
I wrap these here baseballs, base is good, in paper and put them in the retort. So, then I jam the cover down tight. Now give me a lift, Ben. This here's pretty heavy, I reckon. The retort did not seem heavy to Ben as they lifted it to the furnace, and he concluded that Munden had asked him to help him in order that he might feel that he was more than a spectator. He's got the finest feelings, Ben said to himself. He's always trying to make a fellow feel comfortable. They built a roaring fire in the furnace. Now you can tend that fire for two hours, Ben said Munden, while I go downtown and see about getting more coal and a few little things we need. I'll be right back. Don't forget, you got to keep that there retort red hot the whole time. Yes, yes. And then what do we do? Well, you got to keep the retort red hot for two hours, as I told you, just a dull red hot. But at the last, you pile on the coal till it's a real cherry red. And after that? Oh, I'll be here to show you what to do afterwards. During the following two hours, Ben watched the furnace and plied it with coal. A rap on the doors attracted his attention, and he admitted Beth and little Sue. Mother asked us to tell her when you got the first gold from your Golconda. Have you got any yet? Sue asked. I know what that means, too, for Beth told me the story. Not yet, Sue, Ben replied. Maybe you're just in time to see some, though. We're nearly ready to open the retort. He flung in a shovel full of coal. I'm glad you came down, Beth, to see it, for if we get any, it'll be the result of your idea. Nonsense, Ben. Oh, Sue, she exclaimed as she looked up the long funnel of the chimney to where it pierced the blue sky. Think of anyone sitting on those little sticks and being hoisted up that frightful distance. It makes me dizzy to think of it. How did you ever get the rope over the top, she inquired of Ben. Munden did it, Ben explained, one day when he sent me off to buy the mule. Did he climb up on the outside? No, Goosey, of course not. He built a rough scaffolding inside, somehow as he went along, until he could throw a rope over the top. The rest was easy. And is he going to chip off the hole inside? Oh, how can he bear to sit on that thing and let you haul him to the top? Oh, he doesn't mind it. He's been a sailor. He says it's safer than lots of high places he's been in, because there's no wind. So interested had all three been in peering up the chimney that they had not noticed the entrance of several men who were curiously inspecting the interior. Sidney Chalmers was one of them, and while Ben was annoyed by his presence at this particular time, he did not like to ask him to leave. Sid walked about with a supercilious stare which so irritated Ben that he relieved his feelings by flinging shovelfuls of coal into the furnace. The two hours were nearly up, and Munden must soon return. One of the self-invited visitors proved to be a reporter who walked about, notebook in hand, scanning the surroundings. When Munden returned, Ben suggested that the strangers be asked to leave, but Munden did not approve of this. It never did anybody any harm to be on the good side of the newspapers, and it generally does a body heaps of harm to be on the bad side of them, he sagely remarked. Let him get his scoop. That's a real cherry red, he added as he looked at the retort. Give us a hand, Ben. They lifted the retort from the furnace. It's got to chill now, said Munden, and he turned his attention to the reporter, whom he regaled with such Munchausen tales that that experienced gentleman had hard work to separate fiction from fact. Suppose you think your fortune's in sight? Sid contemptuously looked at the retort. I hope so, Sid, and I know all my friends do too, Ben replied. Hopin's cheap. Ben turned away. Isn't it cool enough yet, he called to Munden. Reckon it is, said Munden. Now when I knock off the cover, we got to jump back quick as lightning. The fumes of Quicksilver's deadly, you know. All right, knock her off, Ben responded. You folks better stand well back, Munden said to the others. He struck the cover a few hard blows, and as it flew off, they sprang back to a place of safety. Phew, this is being an alchemist with a vengeance. Fancy our turning that old rubble into gold, Ben said to Munden, who was holding him by the arm. Oh, I say, isn't it time to see now? I guess so. Come along. Visitors and workmen eagerly crowded around the retort. A little sponge of gold was all that remained in it. Munden took it out and weighed it while the others curiously watched him. Ben was visibly horribly disappointed. He had a sickening conviction that the whole thing was a failure. He could read the triumph in Sid's face, and it cost him an effort to put on a bold front and see them all through the gates. 
It's no go, I'm afraid, he whispered to Beth. For answer, she pressed his hand. He closed the gates and turned to Munden. Well, it's a failure. You needn't tell me. I know it. Failure? No, it ain't a failure. Are you saying that to let me down easy? Before God I ain't. Why, boy, what you got tears in your eyes for? Brace up and be a man. I'm trying to, Munden. Ben's voice shook. I don't know what's this all about. Did you expect that their crucible be half full of gold? Maybe your thoughts would be plumb full. There was no reply. Why, on a rough calculation, I reckon this undertaking's going to come out all right. You mean that it's going to pay? Of course I do. What ails you? It seems such a small quantity, Ben faltered. It'll seem smaller yet when it's cast in a bar. I've got to melt this again to get it into shape. Besides, I reckon about half of it's silver. Silver! And silver's worth only fifty cents an ounce. Ben sat down on some lumber and gloomily watched Munden melt the gold in a crucible. Yes, so tis, but gold's worth twenty dollars an ounce. Didn't expect it would all be gold, did you? I'm a-figuring roughly on the tons of stuff you've got in sight and the amount of gold you've got out of one jiggerful, and you've got a good thing all right, Ben. But you're just like all kids. Begging pardon. Unreasonable. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter Nine: The Mysterious Chinese. On the night following the first cleanup, Ben was awakened about midnight. He had been sleeping so heavily that for some minutes after awakening he did not realize where he was. Then the outlines of the rough walls of the room and the regular breathing of Munden recalled him to his surroundings. He was too wide awake to sleep again, and he reviewed the events of the day and then fell to speculating upon the plans for the morrow. Suddenly he sat bolt upright, every faculty alert. There was a sound of stealthy footsteps in the outer room. Ben knew now the cause of his sudden awakening. Someone had entered the building and was creeping about searching for what? The gold? He instantly replied to the question. Ben knew that Munden had placed the gold in a box underneath his bunk. There was so little of it as yet that this had been thought of to be a sufficiently safe place. Should he awaken Munden? It hardly seemed necessary. He crept from his bed and crossed the room to the door. The stealthy footsteps could be heard at intervals as though the person constantly paused to listen. The noise appeared to come from the corner of the building in which the jigger was situated, and Ben concluded that the man was searching there for the gold. Feeling that he could keep quiet no longer, Ben grasped Munden's arm. Hush, he whispered. Don't speak. Someone's out there, looking for the gold. Munden was thoroughly awake in an instant. Together they crept to the door. The noise suddenly ceased, and there followed a long interval of silence. I'm afraid we frightened him off, whispered Munden. Just then a slight sound told them that the burglar was still there. A flash of light through the cracks of the door told them that he carried a dark lantern. Be ready, Munden directed. I'll unlock the door and we'll rush for the gates. He unlocked the door and the partners tore across the rough floor to the gates. They were somewhat surprised to find them locked. Who's there? Stop or I'll fire, cried Ben. They listened, trying to locate the intruder in the darkness, but the silence following this challenge remained unbroken. He must have run up the beach to climb the bulkhead, said Munden. I'll go out and head him off. You stay here and watch. If he's hiding here and makes a sound, you call me. Left alone in the darkness, Ben fancied several times that he heard the burglar moving in the black shadows of the interior. But a careful investigation with the aid of a lantern when Munden returned proved that the place was empty. I don't see how he could have got over that bulkhead so quick, Munden remarked, as he related his unsuccessful attempt to capture the man. Must have been mighty lively, and an acrobat in the bargain to get out of sight in that time. Let's see what mischief he's been up to. The jigger was undisturbed, but they found footprints in the moist ground near the furnace. Maybe he came in a boat, Munden suddenly suggested, 
Maybe he wasn't after our gold at all. Ben stared in surprise. Not after the gold, he exclaimed. Then what in thunder was he after? Can't you guess? No. Well, I was thinking that maybe there's more opium hidden away here that we ain't found. Opium? Well, we found one lot here. Why shouldn't we find some more? Who's to say that we found all there was stowed here? They would have taken it away before this. How could they? They didn't dare come back while there was a chance of them custom house fellers being round, and lately we haven't let this place out of our sight. Not so, replied Ben. You think there's more opium hidden somewhere around this furnace? That's it. Well, I'll take out those loose bricks in the morning, those on the side next to the water, that we didn't touch. In the morning a thorough search was made, but no opium was found. No satisfactory explanation of the presence of the midnight visitor offered itself, but matters of greater importance soon occupied the thoughts of the partners. News of the venture spread. The scoop was read by thousands, and many of the curiously inclined were attracted to the spot. On the second day the crowd was so large that Ben was compelled to close the gates. There were several reporters who took notes, photographed Ben in the interior of the building, and interviewed the partners as to their enterprise. Although Ben was feeling better, he was not entirely at ease. The whole thing seemed so theatrical. It was like working on the stage of a theater. Besides, he was not yet assured of success. While the presence of spectators was flattering, it was rather embarrassing to the workmen. They would have preferred to have made their cleanup without an audience. Skepticism, along with curiosity, was written on the faces of all. And, like all sensation seekers, they withheld any decided opinion until the result should be known. In imagination, Ben could already hear the jeering laughter of the crowd over his failure, and this added to his nervousness. His cheeks were flushed with excitement, and he stole over to where Beth and little Sue were standing and said in an anxious whisper, It's just awful not to know how it's going to pan out. When at length the crucial moment arrived, and he saw Munden scoop up some particles of yellow metal with one hand, while with the other he waved his hat, everything seemed to swim before Ben's eyes. The crowd gave a hearty cheer in which he joined as if in a dream. It was pleasant to be congratulated, and it must be confessed that the boy miner enjoyed being looked upon as a marvel of enterprise. Old Madge appeared to be wonderfully interested in the proceedings, and Ben did not quite like the expression of his countenance when he looked upon the gold. Neither did he like the look of envy which could be seen upon the faces of some others. Can't please everybody, Ben said to himself with a shrug. Some people never like to see anyone else succeed. The rest of it was pleasant enough. There was a sort of Fourth of July excitement about it that was most exhilarating. After the last hanger-on had gone and the gates were shut for the night, Munden remarked that he would go downtown to get a new fitting that was needed. We got twice as much gold today as we did yesterday, he said as he turned to go. Maybe we'll get twice as much as this tomorrow. It's bound to vary. But anyway, we're all right. Well, so long. I'll be back inside of an hour. So long, Ben replied. Left alone on the scene of his triumph, Ben surveyed the mass of rubbish and endeavored to estimate how much it would yield. He had supposed himself to be alone and was surprised to see a Chinaman standing in the opening above the little strip of beach. What do you want here, Ben demanded. I come to see you on business, the man replied in excellent English. How did you get here? Oh, I come in when other people come, and I wait till your partner go because I want to see you alone. With a quick motion of his arm, the man threw back one of his voluminous sleeves and pointed his claw-like fingers to the roof and walls. Ben noted that his dress marked him as a member of the ordinary merchant class of Chinese. You work with the bricks and dirt, he said pointing to the piles of rubbish. What do you intend to do with building? Ben's suspicions were aroused. He wants to drive some bargain with me about that opium business, he thought. Oh, I'll sell it for lumber to some builder, I guess, he indifferently replied. Not worth very much. No, not very much. I notice you have plenty of room here, so I think perhaps you'd like to rent this place to me to store my goods. He darted one of his capacious sleeves inside his blouse and drew forth a card, which he handed to Ben. I give you my card. Ben glanced at the card. Eng Quan Lee, Fruit Packer, Factory, 792 Jackson Street, it read. I shall be here for only a short time, Ben said. 
The lease of this building expires in a few months. Besides, you couldn't store anything here. There are too many holes in the walls and roofs. Oh, that wouldn't matter. My goods are canned. My factory too crowded at this time of year. Fruit season now, you know. For a few months, I'd like to rent another place. I'm sorry I can't accommodate you, Ben said, turning away, but I need all the place myself. I give you thirty dollars a month, the Chinese said with a shrewd glance. This offer increased Ben's suspicion, and he flatly refused to consider it. You make too much money, the other said in conclusion. You're too rich, I think. Well, I leave my card. Perhaps sometime you come to see me. Sometime, he looked Ben squarely in the face, if Mr. Fish makes you trouble, you come to see me. With which enigmatical remark he politely bowed and took his departure. I wonder what he was after and what he meant by that last Ben reflected when he had fastened the gates after his strange visitor. There's something wrong about it, or he wouldn't offer me thirty dollars a month for a part of this crazy old shed. He'll wait a long time, I'm thinking, before he receives a call from me. After thinking the matter over, Ben concluded not to mention it to Munden. He was afraid he might urge him to accept it, and this he did not wish to do. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of the Golden Chimney: A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney: A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter Ten: Work Stopped. The next morning, Ben saw a picture of himself above the title "Our Boy Miner" in one of the daily papers. He felt the sensationalism of it, but he could not deny that it pleased him. Publicity was the penalty one had to pay for being prominent, he told himself. And the thought pulled him very erect, like a balloon tugging at his neckband. He was elated with success. All doubts which he had previously felt about speculation being a hazardous way of making money vanished like mists before the sun. The warnings he had heard all his life from the wiseacres about the slow way being the sure way he now felt to be all nonsense. Indeed, so egotistical is success, and he even wondered that he could ever have felt any doubts. After I've made my fortune, I'll be old fogeyish and save the sense, he reflected. This mining venture is quite a sure way of making money as clerking in a store, and much more rapid. His attention was attracted by something Munden was saying to a reporter who was making a story of their experience. Oh, taint no trouble to show you our operations, Munden remarked. No trouble at all. If t'was a real mine underground, that'd be another thing. Folks was so curious about a mine I once had up in Placer County that I trained a dog I had to show him round. I'd fasten a candle to a strap that went round his forehead, and he'd take him all over that mine. Got so no one at last that when he'd pass any rich ore, he'd stop and bark. Sure, he added, as the hearer's smile proclaimed his incredulity, you can put that in your paper and I'll vouch for it. I wish Munden wouldn't yarn it so, Ben said to himself, and I wish all these folks would go home before we make the clean-up. He drew Munden aside. Can't you get rid of them before we melt the stuff? Don't know. They appear to be powerful interested in what we're doing, the other replied. That's just it. They're too much interested. We've got gold on both days, but there's no knowing how long that luck will last. Suppose we opened the crucible some night and didn't get anything. Well, it wouldn't kill us if we didn't, just once. Just think of what they say. Munden smiled. What do we care what they say, he sturdily asserted. I tell you, Ben, I wouldn't be a bit sorry if it got noised round that we weren't making such a bloomin' lot. Why? Well, it'd keep folks from getting envious, for one thing. The result of the day's work did not greatly vary from those of the other two. About the same small quantity of gold sponge remained in the crucible, and the crowd seemed slightly disappointed. That little bit wouldn't make anybody very envious, remarked Ben. In fact, I doubt if most people would work as hard as we have for it. You think it wouldn't, but you don't know much about envy, and you don't know men. This is the stuff, Munden said as he carefully took the gold from the crucible, be it much or a little of it, that makes wild beasts of men. Most all the sins that make a man into a beast can be laid to this pretty shining dirt. 
On the afternoon of the fourth day, Ben and Munden were working like beavers. About five minutes now and we'll take out the amalgam, Munden remarked. I believe it'll carry more than twice as much as yesterday's. Somehow the stuff shined more when we broke it up. I reckon I've got about a quarter of the chimney chipped. That's slick, said Ben. When do you think we'd better tackle the ground? Oh, that'll keep till we're through with the chimney. You see, a good deal works through the cracks now, and we can make a thorough clean-up afterwards. I believe there's lots of copper as well as gold and silver in that slug under the old wharf. You do? I'm most as certain of it as I am of the chimney. If we make as much as the opium brought, I suppose you'll be satisfied. That would be good enough. Queer them smuggler fellers never showed up, ain't it? The more I think of it, the more certain I am that that was what the burglar was after. But we couldn't find any traces of the drug. Maybe he got it before we run out. Well, most likely some of those government chaps warned him not to come here while the watch was being kept up. There's generally someone who gets wind of such a plan in time to make fools of the rest. I suppose the temptation to be tricky is too much for him. Yes, and I suppose there are many temptations to a man in such a position. Bless you, I guess there is. There's lots of men who'd be square enough if they was let alone, but put him in a place where there's a chance to cheat and someone to show him the way, and they don't need no coaxing. Did you suspicion any of them in particular? Well, Ben hesitated, it's an awful mean thing to say about a man when you've got no proof, he dropped his voice, but you know I didn't like the man who was put in charge of the case. What's his name? Cutter. I couldn't help feeling that he wasn't straight. He didn't seem sincere. He wasn't round here at all, was he? No, but there wasn't any need of his coming. He just stays in the office and directs others. How easily he could warn the men who stowed away the stuff here not to come after it. They made me mad with their suspicions, Munden exclaimed. I should think that Spirians would have taught them to suspect one of their cells sooner than us. It was only one man who showed any suspicions outright, and like as not he was one of the rogues himself. I was half a mind to tell him so once, but I know twouldn't do no good. Not a bit, Ben agreed, and it might do harm. Mining's a curious business. It's the only business on earth, though, where you ain't cutting the ground away from under some other man's feet. You're just a-getting something that everybody wants and needs, and consequently, everybody's glad you're getting it. It's a gamble, and that's why it's so thunder and fascinating. There's one drawback, though. It makes a man distrustful of his kind, I suppose because it's so mighty easy to get fooled. An old miner doesn't believe in anyone but just himself, from principle. It's astonishing how completely he can pin his faith to rocks and how he balks when it comes to trying it on human nature. Father wasn't much so, remarked Ben. He was an exception, I suppose. He wasn't rich, was he? No, although he often thought he was. His riches never came near enough to capture. That's it, you see. But you take an old miner who's made his fortunes and lost him through having salted mines worked off on him if he ain't the scariest bird ever seen. Talk about salt in the bird's tail. Why, he wouldn't trust his own twin brother. Well, there's no danger of ours being salted, no, cause twasn't thought to be a mine. I've seen some queer tricks played in that line. Once I knew a man who went to look at a mine. He saw the samples taken from all over the mine, put them in canvas bags himself, and never took his eyes off these bags till they were sealed up with his private seal. Just as the rest of the party was getting into the stage to leave, the man who was a-thinking of buying the mine had a kind of feeling that he'd been fooled. He couldn't explain it no how, but he just had that feeling. So he wouldn't get on that stage, but he went all over the mine a second time and took another set of samples. Well, the assays told the story. The first set went more than a hundred dollars to the ton, and the last set went less than a dollar. How did they break the seals? They didn't break them. They salted the bags after he sealed them by squeezing a quill toothpick through the canvas and blowing gold dust into them. I don't wonder that. Mudden was interrupted by a pounding on the gates. I'll go, said Ben. When he had unfastened the gates, two men walked into the yard. The first handed Ben a paper. What does this mean? Ben wonderingly asked. He did not at first comprehend the meaning of the proceeding, but his eye caught the word injunction, and he knew that meant stop. It's an injunction served upon you, the man replied. Are you an officer? 
I am. What ground? Ben stopped, for he felt his voice tremble. It's to compel you to stop working another man's property. But I bought the right to work it, from the owner, Ben cried. That he did, Munden spoke up stoutly, and I signed as a witness. Where is the owner? Where is old Madge? I've got a signature to that paper. He can't go back on that, the boy exclaimed. He's done this from spite because I refused to take him into partnership. Don't get excited, the officer said. Mr. Madge has nothing to do with this. There was an angry light in Ben's eyes. Well, who has then, he defiantly inquired. I have, the other man replied. He had not spoken before, and he seemed to enjoy the boy's distress. He was a small man, shabbily dressed, and there was nothing about his appearance to indicate that he could be possessed of wealth. He paused after those two words and appeared to relish prolonging the suspense. Ben turned upon him. What have you got to do with it, he asked. It happened to be the owner of the land and improvements. But you leased it, and the lease does not expire until next November. The improvements belong to the man who leased the land and put them on it. The lease expired a month ago. That is false, Ben's indignation was so great that he could hardly speak. Mr. Madge told us that the lease ran for thirty-five years and commenced in November 1866. That was the date on which the building was commenced, the lease dated from four months earlier. Ben turned to Munden, sick at heart. Can't you remember what he said when I filled in the dates? He said the first pile for the building was drove in November 1866, but he meant for us to think that were the date of the lease, too. Appears like we've been taken in, Ben. The building belongs to me and the rubbish that's here. I've paid for it fairly and squarely, and it's only right that I should be allowed to work here until November. I bought the right to do it. We're not talking about any rights now, young man, except those the law allows, the owner remarked with a dryness that was irritating. You can't trespass on another man's property to work anything. He turned to Munden, who was bending over the jigger. Stop that! That's mine, he cried. Munden straightened himself. In his hand he held a wide-mouthed bottle partly filled with amalgam. No, it ain't, he replied. It belongs to this young man. he just about finished with his day's work when you came in, and it belongs to him. I've got the law on my side. Can't take anything off this property, my property, now. Well then, responded Munden, setting the bottle on the floor of the jigger, neither can you. If you touch this stuff before this thing's settled, I'll have the law on you. The two men looked at each other for a moment. Then Munden drew Ben aside. Tain't no use talking to him. I know him. His name's Fish and he's a regular old shark. Rich as anything. Owns piles of tenements and grinds his tenants down to their marrow bones. I saw him nosing around here on the day we made our first clean-up. Question is, what are you going to do? Oh, I don't know, Ben cried in despair. The two strangers were leisurely surveying the arastra and its contents. Know any lawyer, Munden asked. No. A recollection of Mr. Hale, who had been in the collector's office on the day of his visit, flashed before him. He believed him to be the great lawyer of whom he had heard. He had appeared interested in the venture, if skeptical, and since then the scheme had proved a success. Then was thinking very hard. "'Cause if you do,' Munden continued, "'he might find some hole for us to crawl out of.' This view of the situation was humiliating, but Ben was forced to accept it. Stay here and watch things while I go downtown and see what can be done, he answered. He was angrier than he had ever been in his life. The injustice of being made a victim of fraud seemed to sear his spirit like hot iron. To be tricked, cheated, and have no redress was such a monstrous wrong. To think, he said to himself on his way downtown, how I resisted the temptation not to tell old Madge my whole plan. This is the reward I get for being too conscientious. I ought not to have told a soul. Bitter thoughts crowded fast upon him as he hurried along. He recalled the conversation he had once heard between two young men. One had said that there was not a rich man living who had acquired his wealth, unless it had been inherited, honestly and with a clear conscience. Ben had been impressed with this statement and had repeated it to his father, who had denounced it as false. There are plenty of knaves among rich men, but there are honest men too, his father had said. He must have been a poor man, envious of the wealth of others who said that thing. 
Still, Ben reflected that his father had been a poor man, credulous, trusting in all men, to his own disadvantage sometimes. In order to get on in the world, was it necessary to deceive and cheat, the boy questioned. No, it isn't true, he exclaimed aloud, causing the passers-by to regard him curiously. I'd rather be in my place and know that I've done the square thing than be in his. I wouldn't stain my immortal soul for gold. Sustained by this thought, he found courage to make his appeal. Mr. Hale was in his office, and in a few words Ben told him what had happened. So you've come to grief already, my boy, the lawyer said. Well, let's see what can be done. He asked Ben a few questions and dispatched a messenger to the city hall to search for the recording of the lease. Now go home and wait, he said in conclusion, and don't worry about it any more than you can help. Thank you. About paying you, Mr. Hale, Ben began, but the other interrupted him. Never mind about that. I don't expect any pay. I sometimes do things for pure love of humanity. Queer way to do business, isn't it? But I made my own way in the world, boy, and I know what it is. Why, when I first went in for law, it was like climbing a grease pole backwards. Ben left the office with a lighter heart, as indeed did most people. Like them, too, he had a conviction that the lawyer would find a way out of the dilemma. Mr. Hale had told Ben that he had no right to occupy or work the property while the injunction was pending, so he hastened back to consult with Munden as to the best course to be pursued. He found the latter disconsolately sitting upon the fence. The mule was tied to a post alongside and the pair presented a sorry appearance. The men had departed, Munden said, after nailing up the gates. The partners agreed to take turns in keeping guard over the premises until the result of Mr. Hale's search was known, and it was decided that Ben should take the first night. It's exasperating not to know how much there is in the amalgam. In all justice, it's mine, said Ben, with flashing eyes. And I intend to watch it, and fight for it, too, if need be. You've got to fight such mean sneaks with one weapon, and only one, and that's the law, remarked Munden, carefully whittling a stick he held. There ain't no other way you can get the best of them. He pointed up the hillside. There's your cousin now. She's been down here asking after you. Come out on the point for a while, Ben, said Beth. It will rest you. With a grave face he joined her, and they slowly walked along the beach. End of chapter 10「Eleven of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter 11. A Midnight Fight. I've met one square man, and that's Mr. Hale, Ben said with emphasis, after he had told her about his trouble. And you don't think Munden's square? Ben stopped and faced her. What have you heard, he asked. They say that he was in with the smugglers and led you to discover their opium so that you'd get the reward, and then he'd cheat you out of it. What nonsense! How could he? Oh, I don't know. Somehow. I suppose Mr. Hodges and his wife started that. What more did they say? He stooped and picked up a smooth bit of driftwood which he flung far out into the water. I don't care that for their opinion. They say that you'll never get your money back, that Mr. Fish is the meanest man in town, and he won't give you any show at all, and won't let you take another cent out of the works. Then they've heard about it already, he asked. She nodded. Quick work, and that it serves me right. I dare say that's another thing they say. The girl's face flushed. Yes, they did. Mrs. Hodges was the worst. She said that Munden was a sharper and that you were a greenie. Well, it isn't over yet. They walked on for a few moments in silence. Although Ben spoke up stoutly, he was very despondent. Tell you what I wish you'd do, Beth, he suddenly said. I'm going to watch tonight at the works, and if you should hear me blow a whistle, do you blow Hodges as loud as you can. Three times, you know. Does he still keep one at the house? Yes, ever since he had that trouble about the land that is hung behind the kitchen door. I can easily take it up to my room. All right, your house is so near that you'll be sure to hear me. The gates are nailed up, but I can't help feeling a little nervous. Keep what I've told you to yourself. Do you think you will lose it all, Ben? I can't tell. I'm going to make a fight for it. 
You're awfully worried. I can tell by your face. Well, what if I am? Most men are, most of the time. It's life. Beth sighed. We are rushed along just as if we were on a river, and all we can do is the best we can. If we do that, it's enough. He stopped and ground the heel of his shoe in the damp sand. I heard a man describe it oddly once. He likened life to a dog pit. He called it an arena, but he meant a dog pit. And he said a man had to take hold with a bulldog's grip to succeed. I thought it was horrible then, but somehow it comes back to me now. I never saw you in fighting mood before. Haven't I had enough to make me so? To have that rich old miser take what belongs to me. It's mine and he knows it, and so does everybody else. And if he sneaks through this hole he's found in the lease and takes my gold, he's just as much a thief as if he'd broken into my house and stolen what didn't belong to him. I don't care if the law does back him up. It's dishonest trickery. Maybe you won't be a millionaire after all. The girl's face wore a blank expression. Then she suddenly brightened. But millionaires always go through this sort of thing, don't they? Mr. Palmer landed in San Francisco with only fifty cents in his pocket and chopped wood to earn his dinner. I've heard him tell about it lots of times. I think he'd rather talk about it than anything else in the world. Perhaps, she glanced at Ben, you're too well dressed, Ben, to turn out a millionaire. Perhaps you ought to go barefooted, or at least wear ragged shoes first. Her companion smiled. Girls are always thinking of appearances, he said. But I think you had better give up the hope of my being a millionaire. That's a fairy tale. If I make a few thousand out of this, provided I can beat this old devilfish, I'll be satisfied. I'd set my heart on a million, she replied, but if you're satisfied, I ought to be. You think girls are funny to always be thinking of looks. How can we help it? We're never really in anything. We have to stand one side and see the boys do things. Fighting, for instance, Ben remarked. They had retraced their steps and were again at the entrance of the works. Munden still sat on the fence, thoughtfully gazing at the nailed gates. The mule was wistfully looking at them, too, with an injured air, as indeed was quite fitting in a tenant who had been evicted. "'Good night,' said Ben. "'Don't forget.' "'I won't,' Beth replied. And she added in an undertone, "'Don't tell him,' she indicated Munden, "'that I'm going to listen.' She turned quickly away before Ben had time to reply. Through the long hours of the night, as Ben sat in the shadow of a wall across the street from the works, he had plenty of time for reflection. Although he had indignantly refused to believe the imputation against Munden's honesty, still it kept persistently recurring to him. Can it be possible that he was in with that smuggling gang, and that fear of personal safety made him use me as a cat's paw to inform on them, he asked himself, but dismissed this as being highly improbable. Munden's surprise when the opium was discovered had been too genuine to be doubted. Besides, had he been a party to the smuggling, by exposing it he would have put an end to the business in the future, as far as he was concerned. The Custom House authorities had held a theory that he had been one of the ring from the fact that no one came to remove the opium. As an offset to this, Munden maintained that one or more of the government employees must have been in with the smugglers and warned them. It was a block puzzle, the pieces of which Ben placed in many different positions as the night wore on. How long that night seemed to him. His brain was too excited to permit sleep to trouble him, and his position harassed him. About two o'clock in the morning he saw a figure stealing along in the shadow of the building. The moon was shining and Ben could see that the man stopped and looked around, as if to make sure he was not observed. He's going to climb up and drop through that hole in the roof, Ben said to himself. That's the way he got in before. I've got the burglar at last. The figure paused as if to listen, and then cautiously climbed up the rough side of the building and disappeared through the hole in the roof. Ben decided to go around the building and enter through the opening on the water side. He was obliged to climb the high bulkhead which ran out into the bay, and then he swiftly ran along the beach. Peering within, he saw the man stooping over the jigger and searching for its contents by the aid of a bullseye lantern. He was of slight physique, and there was something about the figure that was strangely familiar. Just then the man raised his head in a listening attitude, and Ben recognized him. Sid, he exclaimed. I always knew he was a mean sneak, but I never thought he'd be a thief. Ben sprang toward him and grasped his arm. That's mine! You are stealing my gold, he cried. The other tried to shake off his accuser, 
Let go, he screamed. But Ben did not relax his hold. Not till you give me what you've stolen. I won't. I have as much right to what I find as you have, Sid doggedly replied, and I'm going to keep what I've got. Let go, I say. For answer, Ben flung himself upon him. They were about equally matched and both fought desperately. A misstep on the ground sent them sprawling among the broken bricks and rubbish. Ben was uppermost and soon would have vanquished his adversary when something flashed before his eyes and he felt the thrust of a knife in his breast. With its remaining strength, he blew a blast on his police whistle and then a faintness overpowered him and he knew nothing more. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of the Golden Chimney A Boy's Mine》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter Twelve In the Sick Room The house in which Beth lived was a dreary structure perched on the northern slope of the steep hill above the works. A dispute, common in the settlement of property boundaries in California, had arisen in regard to the land on which the house stood, and in consequence it had never been painted nor the ground around it enclosed by a fence. From the interior, however, one overlooked these deficiencies because of the gorgeous panorama of bay, mountain, and sky that was framed by every window. Dame Trot, as Ben called her, was the wife of Beth's stepfather, for the girl's own mother had died shortly after her second marriage. The home was not congenial to the young girl, but as Mr. Hodges had used all the money which her mother had left, she was compelled to remain under his roof. Sidney Chalmers was the son of the present Mrs. Hodges by a former marriage. It was in Mr. Hodges' house that Ben regained consciousness on the morning of the encounter at the works. He was conscious of a severe pain in his head and a feeling of great weakness. Someone was talking, and gradually a dim realization came to Ben that he was the subject of the conversation. He recognized the voice of Mr. Hodges. He's been trying to mine the inside of the old smelting works, and Fish the owner served an injunction on him yesterday, just as he was going to get the clean-up for his day's work. That's a strange enterprise, someone replied. Ben recognized the doctor's voice. Yes, I'm thinking he's throwing his money away. Of course he got a little gold, but in my opinion there ain't enough in the whole shebang to pay for the mule he's bought. Then he put money into the scheme? Every cent he had in the world went into it. Crazy! Might just as well stand on the seawall and fling his dollars into the bay. Mine chimneys. Don't you suppose if there were any gold in that chimney, old Madge, who leased the property, would have got it out years ago? He's got Ben's two hundred dollars, though. That's what suits him better than mining soot. He laughed at his poor witticism. Don't talk about it now, the doctor said. He'll come too presently. Ben opened his eyes to see the doctor bending over him. It's all right, my boy, he said. Don't be frightened. Ben dimly wondered where he was. The wound in his breast was painful and he felt very weak. He noticed that Mr. Hodges was standing at the foot of the bed and he surmised that he must have been carried to his house. He closed his eyes and tried to think over the events of the previous night. It wasn't much of a knife, the doctor said, or it would have done more damage. When you feel able to talk, he kindly said to Ben, you can tell us all about it. The patient nodded and closed his eyes again. Everything seemed slipping from him. Guess there ain't much to tell, Hodges said gruffly. It's pretty certain who done it. Ben's senses faintly rallied at this remark. Could it be possible, he thought, that they did not know who his assailant was? He instantly surmised that Hodges suspected Munden. Sid must have made good his escape before they found me, he mentally concluded. What a coward! He lay with his eyes closed a great deal of the time and reviewed the situation. Should he expose Sid? It was hard to keep from doing so when he thought of all he had suffered at his hands. He had been such a brazen thief, too, so shameless in his villainy. Still, by the ramifications of marriage, he occupied the relation of a brother to Beth. At least she treated him as one, and he lived under the same roof with her. Besides, his family had received Ben in his helpless state and were caring for him. A sudden generosity pleaded with him not to expose the culprit. It was such a noble impulse, so far above the standards to which he was accustomed 
that he was almost ashamed to follow it, and tried to belittle it by placing a value upon it. He said to himself half contemptuously, there wasn't more than thirty or forty dollars in the amalgam anyway, and that's a low price for a reputation. When he finds out that I haven't told on him, he can return the gold. At any rate, I'm going to give him a chance. He resolved upon this course, although it annoyed him that Munden should be suspected, and he felt that he must exonerate the latter. You said just now, Mr. Hodges, that you were pretty certain who, who did this to me. Yes, I did, and I am, emphatically replied Mr. Hodges. It's that man Munden you've been taken in by who's done it. You're all wrong, Ben answered. He had nothing to do with it. Where was he then? Where is he now? He had to find a place for the mule. Then he went downtown to sleep. Of course, he couldn't sleep in the room we built because the place doesn't belong to us, they say. Mr. Hodges looked the doubt he felt. Let him give an account of himself first, Ben, before you're too sure of his innocence. He'll come around just as soon as he hears of this. Ben closed his eyes wearily, but suddenly opened them again. There he is now. I can hear his voice, he cried as Munden appeared. Well, Ben, my boy, how'd this happen? Munden's distress was too genuine to be doubted. I saw a man taking the amalgam, and I tried to stop him. We got into a fight over it, and he scratched me a little. That's all. All? Isn't it enough, Munden indignantly cried. How white you are, Ben. Why, you're almost fainting away now. No, I'm all right, Ben hastened to say. You don't look it. What sort of looking man was he? Ben closed his eyes. I don't know. It was dark, you know. "'Twas bright moonlight, and there's a lot shines through the holes in the roof on a clear night. Ain't you got no idea what he looked like?" Ben shook his head. Munden reflected a moment. "'That's queer, Ben. You don't tell us enough about the man for us to get hold of anything,' he said. "'I'd like to get at him. You had a tussle with him, yet you don't say whether he was fat or thin or tall or short. We ain't got nothing to go by.' Ben smiled faintly. "'What's the use of going?' We couldn't afford to hire a detective. It would cost more than the cleanup amounted to. Besides, the fellow's got away by this time. He appeared to take it mighty easy-like. Might have killed you. I'd like to give him a good drubbing on my own account, said Munden. Hodges cast a lowering look from one to the other. He was too stubborn to relinquish at once his theory that Munden was guilty, that the man's bearing and conversation were puzzling. He's the boldest chap that ever lived, and Ben's the greatest fool, or else I'm on the wrong tack, he reflected. I believe I'll find out whether he turned up at his hotel at three o'clock in the morning or not. As soon as he heard the front door close upon Munden, Ben called out to little Jim, who hung around the bed in mute sympathy. Where's Sid? He didn't sleep at home last night, the boy replied. Mr. Hodges looked surprised, and there was an awkward pause, during which Ben thought best to close his eyes again. He said last night that he was going to stay all night with Tom Miles because they was going clamming early this morning, Jim added. Then why didn't you say so in the first place, his father said as he strode from the room? Ben's pale cheeks had grown quite pink. Jim, he said in a low voice, will you do something for me? Sure. Well, I wish you'd find out where Sid is and tell him I want to see him. You can tell him how I got hurt and that nobody knows who did it. Tell him that the doctor says I'll be all right in a few days. Is there anything else you'd like, Ben? Because if there is, I've got a dollar and fifty cents what I'm a-saving up to buy a safety with, and I just as soon take some of it as not. No, thank you. Just do that one favor for me, and it's all I'll ask. Jim departed, and in an hour or so reported that Sidney could not be found. Tom Miles had expected to dig for clams, but as Sidney had failed to put in an appearance, he had given it up. Inquiry at the store where Sidney was employed developed the fact that he had not been seen there since the evening before. Shortly afterwards, Beth and little Sue paid Ben a visit. By a few adroit questions, Ben saw that they had no suspicion of Sid's part in the night's work. If you'd only made the thief give up the gold, it would have been some satisfaction, Beth said. Yes, that's so, but this is only a scratch anyway. You'll have to be careful, the doctor says. I mean to be but it frets me so to stay in bed that it does more harm than good. I want to see Mr. Hale. Yes, and you want to find the robber. Of course, if I can, Ben wearily agreed. 
but I shan't waste much time on him. Ben had plenty of time for reflection during his enforced stay in bed. Ever since the day of the injunction, when Munden had mentioned the name of the owner of the land, he had been haunted by the thought that he had known or heard something of the man before, but it was not until the second day after the robbery that it suddenly flashed upon him that he was the man of whom the mysterious Chinaman had spoken. Fish, he exclaimed, and little Jim, who was hovering about his bed, was forgetting him some at once. I was only thinking aloud, Ben explained, I don't want any fish, and added with a grim smile, I've had enough of that article already, at which Jim looked thoroughly puzzled. What possible connection could there have been between a band of Chinese smugglers and Mr. Fish, the wealthy miser, Ben asked himself. He was there on that first day, so Munden said, and the Chinaman may have overheard something of his plans. I'll fight him, see if I don't when I get out of this. His impatience to be able to investigate the affair increased hourly. He must see the Chinese and find out what he had meant by his strange warning. As he had not told Munden about the Chinaman's offer, he decided not to tell him of his resolve to visit him. Aside from his former suspicions, a love of adventure made him anxious to undertake the thing alone. He was forced to wait a week before he was well enough to leave the house. During this time, Sidney had not been heard from. His mother would not permit a public announcement to be made of his disappearance, claiming that it was probable that he had met a cousin from San Jose and had gone to that city for a visit. Whether she had any suspicion of the truth or not, Ben could not determine. But she put an end to all open speculation on the part of the family as to the whereabouts of the absent one by emphatically declaring, Sid's old enough to take care of himself. He's my flesh and blood, and so long as I don't fret about him, I don't see as anyone else needs to. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter Thirteen: The Opium Raid. Although Ben had been eager to go in search of his strange informer, Yet when he set forth he almost regretted not having brought a companion. He knew that the address given must be in the heart of the Chinese quarter, and like most San Francisco boys, he knew something of that dangerous locality. He had heard of the mysterious murders which at times were of almost daily occurrence, of the sick thrust into the street to die, and of the opium dens, where white people were hidden. He had heard, too, of the fierce dogs which were kept on the roof of the houses, of secret passages leading from house to house until the place was a vast honeycomb of runways through which the Chinese slipped like rats in their holes. Chinatown may present a peaceful appearance in the daytime, but at night, with the weird effects caused by the many-colored lanterns, the inky recesses of the doorways, the depths of underground burrows trod by velvet-footed shadows, it is transformed into a region to strike terror to the bravest. Perhaps the thought of these dangers induced Ben to choose broad daylight for his quest. He found the address easy enough, a house of several stories that in some earlier period of the city had been an imposing residence, but was now used by the Chinese for a fruit canning factory. The casing of the door was plastered with gaudy bills covered with Chinese characters, and through the broken window panes could be seen countless piles of cans. A short flight of steps led downward from the sidewalk to a basement entrance, and as Ben approached, he saw a Chinese leaning against the iron balustrade. He recognized Eng Kwan with a feeling of relief that he should not be obliged to enter the house. In this he was mistaken, for the man would not talk upon the public street, where the very gutters might have ears. He conducted Ben through several corridors and stairways to an upper room, where a number of Chinese were seated at a repast of rice and tea. Ben did not like to broach the object of his visit before such an audience, and waited until the meal was finished and the others had departed. "'You wish to rent part of your house?' his host blandly inquired. "'I haven't any house to rent at present,' Ben replied. "'I want to find out what you mean when you say Mr. Fish make me plenty trouble, you sabi? The language used by the man was a rebuke. "'Ah, that man make you trouble already?' "'Yes, trouble enough. Come, tell me, what do you know about him?' 
For what object should I tell you? Perhaps it might make me trouble. He say when I have trouble, come and see you. I have trouble, I come. You tell me what you know, I give you ten dollars. The Chinese regarded him with a sphinx-like stare. Oh, ten dollars is not much money to me, he remarked indifferently. I'd like to rent from you, that's all. On that day I speak to you, I go with the crowd to see what you do. I hear Mr. Fish talk to old man. Old man with a big gray hat and a cane, Ben eagerly inquired. Yes, I suppose those men think I not understand much English, but they not pay much attention to me. Mr. Fish say to old man that it is too bad to lose so much money. They mean your gold. They watch it. Then they talk about a lease, and old man say it not good any more. Mr. Fish say he will fix book at City Hall, then stop you and work for gold himself. He say he will give the old man some. I can't understand, said Ben, why, if the lease has expired, he should need to fix the record. Did he say anything else? No, that's all I hear. Well, that's helped me some, perhaps. Here's your ten dollars. Ben paid him the money with some regret. It seemed a good deal for the information. Still, it might be a clue to ravel the tangle. Suddenly there was a loud knock at the door, followed by a noisy pounding. Ben had not noticed that the door had been locked after him, and he turned to Eng Kuang in surprise. The Chinese did not respond to the summons, but hurried with an ashen face through the inner door, which he closed and locked behind him. Ben heard some heavy bolts shot into place and realized that he was in a very unpleasant position. The pounding increased, and he saw that the door could not withstand the assault much longer. Alone in a locked room, into which the police were forcing an entrance. Suddenly it flashed into his head that his visit to the house might have been noticed, that his connection with the opium found that the works might have strengthened the suspicions of the police and caused the raid. If this were the case, he knew it was better for him to have remained where he was than to have followed the Chinaman, even if he had been given the opportunity. In a few moments the door gave way with a crash, and two policemen and several customs officials burst into the room. Ben recognized one of the men who had been stationed to watch the works. Oh, it's you, is it? the man triumphantly exclaimed. They thought you were too innocent looking to be in with the gang, but I knew better all the time. We've caught you now. Caught me? Ben indignantly repeated. At what, I'd like to know? I came here to get some information from the proprietor of this fruit canning factory. Information? Fruit factory? The man sneered. That's a likely story. This place has been under suspicion for some time as being one of the biggest opium dens and smuggler storehouses in town. During this conversation, the other men had turned everything in the room topsy-turvy. They found nothing to reward their search in the front room and turned their attention to the door which led to the inner room. It took some little time to demolish this, and when at length they gained entrance, not a Chinese was to be found. One inmate they dragged forth from one of the rooms, but as there was no evidence against him, no charge could be preferred. Ben took him by the arm. Come home, Sid, he said. It's all right. I haven't told a soul. They pushed their way through the curious crowd which had invaded the house. When they were quite away from the neighborhood, Sidney broke down. You're mighty good to me, Ben. I don't deserve it. It's nothing at all, Ben replied. Isn't your good name worth a little forbearance from one who's known you all your life? How'd you come to be in that place, he sharply questioned. I didn't know where else to hide. I was afraid I'd kill you, and I got Eng Kuang to let me stay there and make out some bills and accounts for him. Then you've earned your keep, honestly? Sid looked him squarely in the face. Yes, he said. Ben gave a sigh of relief. It might have made a fuss, he remarked. Why, did they try to find me? No, because your mother said she felt sure you had gone to San Jose. To San Jose, Sid repeated in surprise. After a pause, he added, Mothers are queer, sometimes. Ben did not reply, for he knew that Sid thought that his mother suspected the truth. I meant to venture out tonight, to try to find out how you were and give you your gold, Sid continued. Here it is. He held out the vial. I hope I'll never pass such a week of torture again. It has been a mean experience for us both, Ben replied as he took the vial, but maybe it's done us both good. I'll keep a nugget or lump out of this, he held up the vial containing the amalgam, 
for the scarf pin I promised you once. No, thank you, Ben. I'd rather not take it, Sid replied. Just as you say, Ben put out his hand, for they had reached the foot of the hill. Sid took the preferred hand with such a hearty grasp that Ben felt that the experience had made them better friends than they had ever been. That's over, I'm thankful to say, said Ben to himself as he rapidly walked down the street. And now for Mr. Hale. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding. Chapter Fourteen, A Crime Discovered. Mr. Hale was in his office when Ben reached there but the latter concluded that he would hear the result of the lawyer's investigation first, reserving his bit of information until afterwards. "'Well, my boy,' said Mr. Hale, whirling around in his chair, "'I'm sorry not to have better news for you.' The kind light shone in his eyes. "'We've got a hard old customer to deal with, I'm afraid. I've had the records searched and the entries of the lease were found to have been duly and properly made.' He tilted back his revolving chair and put the tips of his fingers together. I don't see what we're going to do about it. We've run up against a stone wall without apparently a cranny in it. I say apparently, because one never knows what developments may turn up. It's a case of manifest injustice, but such cases are of daily occurrence. Something has turned up, Ben said when Mr. Hale had finished. Ah, so you've got some news. Let's have it. Ben related his conversation with the Chinese. Mr. Hale was astonished. I can scarcely believe that that old miser would meddle with the records, he exclaimed. It looks very like it. Yes, if what Eng Kuang says is true, Fish is a grasping old shark, but what object could he have, he mused. I'll tell you, exclaimed Ben. The lease is just as he says it is. But there must have been some mistake in placing the dates on the record, and that mistake was in our favor. It may be so, and the old fellow was so angered in being baffled after he'd made sure that the law was on his side, he was so angered that he went to the length of changing the figures. That sounds like the truth, Mr. Hale. I think you've struck it, Ben, but it's such an amazing thing that it seems incredible. He's shrewd, but he's overreached this time. Yes, for a man of his means to tamper with the records for the sake of the money you expect to make, to what length will not money-grasping take a man? What are you going to do about it, Mr. Hale? Ben could not resist asking the question. I'm going to have a microscopic examination made of the records, and if what we think is so, he shall pay dearly, he brought his fist down on the desk in front of him, for his bad work. I've got several old scores to his account that I'd like to settle. How long will it take? To make the examination? About five minutes. What a weapon it will be! Exactly but you must cultivate patience when you have anything to do with the law. Do you think he's alone in the matter? I mean, do you think he did it himself? No, undoubtedly he hired someone to do it. We must find his tool. Mr. Hale was as eager as a sportsman when he has caught sight of his game. We can get the grand jury after him. If it's true, he gleefully added. Ben rose. Then there is nothing to do at present, but... Wait, supplied Mr. Hale, smiling. Come in tomorrow at this time. I may have some news. Ben resolved not to tell Munden of the new developments in the case until he knew the result of Mr. Hale's investigation. It was hard work keeping the new hope to himself. Munden was so depressed that Ben longed to brighten him with the story of the day's events. On the afternoon of the following day, Ben found himself impatiently awaiting Mr. Hale's return from court. When he caught sight of the latter's beaming face, he knew that the result was favorable. It's all right, my boy, the lawyer exclaimed. It's just as we thought. I'll have you mining again before you're many days older. The dates had been changed, Ben's voice was a little uncertain. Yes, and a bad bungling job they made of it, too. I'm surprised my clerk didn't notice it in the first place. But of course he wasn't looking for such sharp work as that. By the way, I told a reporter on the Gazette, you know, they keep a man around the city hall on the lookout for news, who came to see what my expert was about. 
Then it'll be in the papers. Well, I told him all he wanted to know. You're not afraid of the papers, are you? No, I've done nothing that I'm ashamed of. Exactly. Tomorrow morning, Mr. Fish's large circle of enemies will read with pleasure that he has been caught at last. There's another reason why I'm glad the whole story's going into print. About that opium business? Yes, I think it will clear me from any suspicion of being connected with the ring. I'd like the real reason to be known for my being in Eng Kwan's house. Well, it will be now. Ben went straight from the lawyer's office to Munden. The latter was looking more disconsolate than ever. Even the mule seemed to have caught a state of abject misery. I've just been thinking how I could get out of this old town, Munden said. If I could manage to get to Cripple Creek, I'd be able to get on my feet again. Ben did not reply, and Munden glanced at his face. Why, Ben, you look as if you've heard some good news. So I have, partner. Mighty good news. Wow! He flung his cap above their heads. We're going to beat that muckery pair, fish, and madge. Sure as you're born. Either you've gone plumb crazy, Ben, or else... Tell me about it, boy. How'd you down him? During the recital of the story, Munden gave Ben a keen glance when it came to the part relating to Eng Kwong. It was an awkward moment for both, and Ben regretted his silence at the time the incident occurred. You forgot to mention the Chinaman's visit at the time, Munden remarked. But time will tell, Ben, and I ain't never been afraid of time. On the day following the investigation, the Gazette published the story of the smelting works claim. Ben read the account aloud to Munden, sitting on the fence outside the works. Of course, in the tale, Ben was made a hero and Mr. Fish a double-dyed villain. They haven't got him black enough to suit me, said Munden, fiercely whittling the stick he held. I hope they'll paint him blacker and blacker every day for a year. There were two items of news in the article, however, that Ben had not foreseen. The simultaneous disappearance of Mr. Fish and one of the clerks in the city hall. Now that there's no one here to stop us, I'd like to smash open those gates and finish our work. Munden shook his fist at the gates, which glowered back at him. I've been turning over in my mind all that there slag that's under the old wharf. I believe there's heaps of copper and lead buried there. No wonder you've been depressed. With all that on your mind, commented Ben. I'm to know today just how long it will be before the injunction can be raised. Mr. Hale says this hard luck story of ours will hurry things. It's going to create sympathy for our case. Well, it ought to. Say, Ben, just let me drop through that hole in the roof and do a little work on the quiet. Ben shook his head. It won't do no harm. You can sit here and watch. No, Munden, not for a million. How easy it is to talk about refusing a million when you're young. This thing's going to be square on my part. I've made up my mind to stick to that, Ben answered. Hello, that boy looks like Mr. Hale's office boy. He sprang down from the fence and tore open the envelope which the boy gave him. Hurrah! Munden, we've won, Ben cried. It's ours, and you can smash those gates as soon as you please. Munden slid down from his perch and, seizing a piece of scantling, struck the old gates a mighty blow that started the nails from the wood. There, he said, that does me good. I've wanted to smash him ever since those smarties came and nailed him up. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding Chapter 15 Ben Chooses a Profession Within the works they found everything, with the exception of the amalgam which Sid had taken, exactly as they had left it. Munden was particularly pleased to find the jigger undisturbed. Here's the slag, I mean, Ben. I've dreamt about that there identical lump for three nights running. Munden pointed to the rugged top of a lava-like boulder, which reared itself from a corner of the earthen floor. I guess you're right about the metals there are in it, said Ben, but it might be an aerolite for all I know. What's that? Say it again. An aerolite. It's a lump of metal they find when a meteor falls and it's unlike anything found on this earth. Oh, a fallen star. 
I knew a man who wrote some poetry about one that fell in Australia. He called it Stardust, but I suppose a hard-as-nails professor would call it by the name that you do. While speaking, London was surveying the ground. I've got a scheme, Ben, to grade all this stuff according to its value. How do you mean? Well, we've had experience enough to see that it'd be the best way to economize our time and labor. We'll assay it and grade it till we know about where we stand. It'll be an awful lot of work to do it. Yes, it'll be tedious, but it'll pay better in the end. Well, if you say so, Ben, of course it's your own business, but I'm just telling you how I'd do it if it were mine. We'll separate the stuff cordon to size first and then cordon to value. It's a good plan. Don't defer to me any more, you idiot. It makes me feel so mean when you do it. You know as well as I do that I don't know the first thing about this business. You're the boss, Ben, Munden laconically replied. I don't doubt that the slag and muck and all the rest of it are valuable, said Ben, but the chimney, our golden chimney, is a thing we're sure of now. Maybe the day's cleanup will be more, or maybe it'll be less, but we know it'll be gold. You're right. We've tested that and we're sure of it, but we mustn't despise the rest on that account. Now here's where the roaster stood. It must have stood here because it couldn't have stood any place else. Well, I'm going to sink a shaft here. London stooped as he spoke, and with his pocket knife he dug a small hole from which he unearthed several small lumps of metal. Just as I thought, he said as he weighed them in his hand, lead ore that'll assay heavy and silver. Then there are those dumps, made when the furnaces were put in, you thought. We haven't touched those yet. You mean outside, where the old fence stood? Yes, why, well, just look here. Ben drew Munden outside the gates to where some mounds rose from the beach. It's my opinion that this board that's nailed on the fence here, opposite these heaps, was put here to mark them. They're heaps of waste, most likely. Something's been scratched into the wood. Let's see what it is. They carefully examined the board, and Ben deciphered the inscription, Waste Bullion. Just think, he cried, that old Madge has let this pile of stuff that's one-third solid silver maybe stay here all these years. And Mr. Fish, close as he is too, he added, it's awfully funny. It ain't funny that Fish didn't do nothing with it, because he's the kind that just collects rents and forecloses mortgages. He wouldn't put up a cent in any venture like this. He'd call it uncertain. But old Madge is a born miner. Well, it is funny. He'll be wild. It used to be a shed inside the old fence and a sort of outside yard, Ben remarked, but they both fell down years ago. That's so, Munden replied as he stooped and carefully examined the ground. Yes, here's the post the shed rested on. We'll excavate five or six feet deep here, on the site of the old shed. It's bound to pay us for our trouble. After it's been all these years on the open beach? What's that got to do with it? Nobody's ever mined here. It stands to reason they'd have stored more valuable stuff in the shed than they would in the open. And there's the signboard, telling us that these dumps are waste bullion. During the weeks that followed their return to their claim, the partners worked industriously. They sifted the result of their labors in three dumps, graded according to value. The first was coarse base bullion, which assayed at $200 a ton. One piece, the largest, weighed about 20 pounds. The smallest pieces were the size of peas. The second pile consisted of fine bullion, its component particles ranging in size from a pea to a pinhead. This assayed at $150 a ton. A third pile averaged from $75 to $100 a ton. The total product of this, representing a week's work, they estimated to be about $1,700. The site of the old shed was excavated, and water was brought to the spot in a flume, for Munden thought best to wash the ground in a rocker before putting it through the jigger. The result amply repaid them for their trouble. This beats me, rocking on the beach of San Francisco and making our two or three hundred dollars a day, said Munden, one day as they were digging several feet below the surface. It beats anything I ever heard of, Ben replied, but I am willing it should. Ben worked so hard during the day that he was too tired when night came to do anything but go to bed as quickly as possible. One Sunday afternoon he paid a visit to Beth. He had not seen her for some time and was anxious to know what progress she was making at school. She saw him coming and came running to meet him. Will you walk out to the point, Ben? Yes, we don't do any work on Sunday. 
Well, it's come true, Beth, he said, when they were well away from the house. Most of it has at any rate. Oh, I'm so glad. We're far enough along now to form a pretty correct figure of what there is in sight, and we've got four weeks more to work in. How much will you make? Well, how much do you guess? Oh, I don't know, the girl earnestly replied. You say it's come true, and you must mean your fortune we used to talk about, so I guess you're not disappointed. Everybody's so curious to know what you're making. They can keep on being curious. I had enough of people's curiosity before, he grimly added. The work on the beach we have to do outside, but we don't allow a soul inside the gates now. I know you don't, and they say the reason is that you're not cleaning up anything and don't want anyone to know it. Ben gave a dry laugh. Or else we don't want anyone to know how much we're making. Why wouldn't it work that way? It would, said Beth. Do tell me, Ben. I'm just dying to know. How much will it be? From ten to twelve thousand dollars. What? You don't really mean it. Indeed I do, but you mustn't tell yet a while. When they reached the house on their return, Mrs. Hodges awaited them in the doorway. Found any nuggets, Ben, she facetiously remarked. No, he laughed. That yarn about finding them in chimneys was a fairy tale, I think. But we found the stuff to make them out of, which answers our purpose quite as well. Her husband looked over her shoulder. If the lease was never recorded, or was done wrong, Ben, couldn't Fish oust you if he wanted to? I suppose he could, strictly speaking, Ben replied, but you see he overreached. He played a mean, dishonest trick in having a false entry made in the record, and now he doesn't dare to come back for fear of being arrested. But he'll come back sometime when the thing's blown over. Well, I'll be through with the works by that time, Ben remarked as he bade them good night. When the last day came, it was with considerable regret that the partners made preparations to leave the works forever. I don't want to stay one day longer than the time I'm entitled to, said Ben. It's paid us well for our work, but I wouldn't care to go through it all again. It has been sort of a worrisome job, Munden replied. Still, it's big pay. Seven thousand dollars for a boy like you to make in three months? Besides, there's worry in all sorts of business, and a man's just got to make the best out of it, he philosophically added. Do you know, Ben, now that it's all over, I can tell you. I know there was a time when you mistrusted me. Not exactly mistrusted, either, but you had the thoughts out of which mistrust is made. Oh, you needn't say you didn't, he exclaimed as Ben made a gesture of dissent. I knew just as well as if you told me so that you did. I ain't a-holdin' it up again, you neither. I know how many there was to put such things in your head again a stranger, like I was. Well, I didn't let them stay there, Munden. I trusted you all through. They heartily shook hands. I believe you did, boy. I believe you did. It's been a tough job, though, in places. What with the smuggling business and your getting cut, and the injunction, too. But taking it all through, just lumping it, you don't regret it, do you? No, Ben replied. We've got through by the skin of our teeth in places, he continued. It was a chance, though, that I didn't lose every cent I had in the world. It was just the merest accident that that Chinaman overheard those two rascals and put us on their track. Besides, we weren't dead sure, we couldn't be, that there was any gold in the old ramshackle works when I bought them. It's too much like gambling to suit me. I'm not saying a word against your going into whatever you want to, but for myself, I'm going to choose something that's slower and surer. Made up your mind yet what it'll be? Yes, I'm going to Berkeley, to college to fit myself to be a mining engineer. That's the very best thing you can do. I'm glad that you approve. You see, I've got money enough to carry me through. And if I've got brains enough too, I'm all right. Going to stick to mining, I see. Yes, Munden. But with this difference, I'm going to equip myself to mine for others. I needn't mine for myself unless I choose to. End of the Golden Chimney, A Boy's Mine by Elizabeth Gerberding